so low that he goes in tomorrow and he's like, well, I don't even care what happens after what happened last night. <laughs> Thank God that's over. <laughs> oh, man. You people are just happy that it's Friday, but I'm double happy. <laughs> and I had 126% mic last night. <laughs> that's hot. Yeah, I was I was watching something that was talking about submarine commanders and they were talking about the hunt for Red October and they're going, Well, we're running at hundred and ten percent and he's like, push it to hundred and fifteen and the, the sub submarine commander's going, It doesn't do that. It's a hundred percent. Point zero. Well, I mean I, yeah. I'm, I'm just dropping and nonsense I, in our Discord chat to uh, make Brian happy. Yeah. Oh, this one's my favorite nonsense. <laughs> so, I understood what we were talking about last week uh, with some of the craziness involving, you know, GameStop and all that. But it wasn't until like two or three days later that I sat down and actually had an in, like a in depth conversation with somebody about how that all worked. And now that meme is even funnier. Daddy Musk is going to take us all to Mars, isn't he? <laughs> it just it gets better like like a fine wine. I think the one Chewie has to drop is the uh, the toaster tank. I do not I just have that sitting around, luckily. No? Because no, that one, incident. every time you I look at that. it, I, I've looked that. at it. I, I can't look at it and not laugh like a little schoolgirl. Oh god, we don't we don't have time for that. We have to we have to do a podcast. Yeah. I don't know if this is my fault or if this is just normal. Oh, it's uh, definitely normal. It's it's both. The, okay. I, I hesitate to use the word normal on this show. Fair. So baseline. Yeah. All right, look. Are we are we good the to go? The more people that are on, I'm the good. more we don't get work done. There you go. Go for it. Yes. Oh, that's a classic right there. Uh, I feel like that one comes up a lot. What in the hell are we talking about now? Indicate. Oh, you said that like something just got added to the chat. Like right oh, I then. I just went back down. I was looking at the musk when I came back down. I'm like, ah ha 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 ha. Oh, Lord. Uh, All right, I'm chat. Five... Sorry, we're going to stop discussing things you can't see. <laughs> Holy moly. Is that That's right. I did not realize The Hunt for Red October was a 31-year-old movie. Yeah. That was an Alec Baldwin who actually was not, like, old and chubby. All right. Let's 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 do the show now. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. All right, everybody, shut up for a second. Oh, jam! Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Mana Pool. This is, if I got my numbers right, episode 611 of the Mana Pool. Yeah, because last one was 610. That's how numbers work. Excellent. Uh, Math. I am... We're, we'll explain what's going on in a minute. But first, I am Chewy, the lead dork, and I have these other dorks here with me. Hey, I'm Brain. I am the... Did you just say Brain? He did. Okay. I said Brian. Did I say Brain? It sounded like you said Brain. Like you, <laughs> like you, your voice had autocorrect. <laughs> yes, I, I am Brain. <laughs> <laughs> oh what are we going to... What are we going to do tonight, Chewy? <laughs> so, do the night. <laughs> oh so my God. Uh, uh, I'm here to get us off task and apparently I'm getting, I'm getting an early start. I'm the lead rambler and tangent master of the group. And I don't even have a witty thing to follow that up with. So yeah. I'm just waiting for the next person to start so I can interrupt them, except now I've given it away. So, uh, you ever notice this... Mike doesn't follow these yeah. very well? <laughs> well, I was trying to come up with um, if there was anything 
new and different to say since this is a a non magic episode. But um, spoiler yeah, alert! I'm like, um, yeah, spoilers. I'm here to spoil the ending of <laughs> whatever we're talking about. Rosebud. <laughs> Spoils the beginning. Does it? I've never King actually Kong seen that. Falls off the building. It's the first scene. <laughs> Jesus dies at the end. But don't worry, dude. He comes dude, back. I... <laughs> yeah. Dude, I I actually took Carrie to see uh, the Jack Black uh, King Kong. And Wait, she... did Jesus lead to that, or did Rosebud lead to that? <laughs> Both. Okay. No, somebody said King Kong dies, falls off the building. And I was just going to say that I took Carrie to see that and she did not actually, she had not actually seen the original and she was like super sad and pissed at, you know, the, the humans for that happening. So <laughs> that's adorable. <laughs> Is it my turn? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I think you're up. All right, so I'm Dirk, the self-proclaimed greenest man alive and moral compass of the group. And as Jafuji said, fun fact, The Hunt for Red October is a 31-year-old movie. And there are 31 days in October. Coincidence? <laughs> I think not. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> Double Halloween. <laughs> it's all coming together. Half-Life 3 confirmed. <laughs> Didn't that come out? That's no. never coming out. Okay. If it ever does, we have to restart the internet. Pretty much. Oh, is it Y2K all over again? That's 21 years old. Oh, God. Yes, that is how numbers work. <laughs> right, so we have a guest, too. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> all right, well, that's our amazing <laughs> guest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess for uh, for audio listeners, uh, hi, this is Bill slash Squee from. I'm assuming everyone listening has seen or heard every single episode of The Mandible, so you already know who I am from a long time ago. Oh yeah, it's like I was brought back in some sort of remake or reboot. <laughs> Boiler alert! So we're gonna remake The Mandible. But we're gonna cast Bill as I don't know. I was Whoa. chewy when we did that in one of the April Fool specials. <laughs> oh, he broke the golden rule. You don't talk about the April Fools. Episodes. No, that was the old thing. We we rebooted it. You're no, gone. we rebooted. It's fine. We have new rules now. We have to upset the audience and also allude to old things. Those are the two things you try to do with every reboot, isn't it? Uh, Midichlorians. Ah! <laughs> All right, now you really have to leave. Hey, let me kick Bill off the call. Wait. <laughs> okay, so, uh, yes, hello. Uh, as has been spoiled already, we are doing a f well, not technically a first, but a first that was deliberate. We're doing a non-magic episode of the Mana Pool, uh, in an effort to, uh, in all honesty, sort of slowly drift away from magic not entirely but some and so broaden our horizons broaden our horizons not stay locked into one topic so since this is our first one i wanted to do something awesome so in this episode and this was this was my idea too wasn't it wow usually yeah. weird things are brian's idea oh, yeah. <laughs> it's true so that in this episode speciality. we're going to look at Reboots, remakes, re-releases, remasters, or apparently the term is legacy sequels. Sequels that came way, 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 way later. Think uh, Cobra Kai. If, can I use, is it, am I allowed to use magic as a reference? Or are we like, is it yeah, prohibition? Sure, I already it's have like ways to snap. work magic in yeah. uh, uh, here and there just. So Welcome to the speakeasy. We still got magic here. Yeah. Nah. <laughs> uh, it's like Cold Snap. Exactly. They're... Yeah. 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 Cold, Cold Snap is totally a legacy sequel to uh, Ice Age. Ice Age. Plot. Yeah. Yeah. That came. It's a sequel that nobody really wanted that came years and years and years and years later. Yeah. Although it, it was pretty well received at the time. So. 
which it's completely we, irrelevant to the point. But the whole yes. purpose here is to talk about uh, remakes, reboots, re-releases, remasters, legacy sequels, whatever. Whether it's uh, movies, TV shows, video games, those are the three uh, media we're going to focus on, I think. And try to determine what causes these things to be either good or bad. Because we can all rattle off amazing examples of each. And we can all rattle off terrible examples of each. And mm-hmm. it's it's hard to, to tell why just right. at first blush. So we're going to see if we can figure it out tonight on this episode. So the point of this episode, as we discuss, is not necessarily just to list these, but you will hear plenty of examples of them. Oh, a bunch. Of, yeah. So... Let's start off by defining these terms. So I think the easiest is a re-release. A re-release yes. is just the same thing, mostly the same thing, just it comes out again. Like when Grease yeah. uh, showed up in theaters, I think it was 20 years later. Right. I took a girl to the, the theater to, to see that. That's the first time I'd ever seen Grease was in a theater, so that's pretty cool. I think Neat. they I think they re-released Titanic um yep. sometime oh. like yeah. Oh man, when Jurassic Park was re-released, uh yeah. Ashley and I, not Mike's wife, but Hot Girl at Work and I went to see it. We were like the only two people in the theater, so we sat there and just poked fun at Jurassic Park in the theater by ourselves. It was awesome. <laughs> that sounds fun, yeah. And it, it still keeps up way. pretty well. Well, yeah, because it was amazing. Mm-hmm. It's still my life goal to, to watch Jurassic Park with Steph, who's never seen it somehow. Like, on purpose. What? The trick is being super young. No, no, like, on, she's never seen it on purpose. But anyway, we're getting off topic. Uh, <laughs> you already see with the error of this, <laughs> this episode. A, a remaster is when something is re-released, but with upgrades. So, like, the obvious example is the Star Wars Special Edition. Yep. Need more do Where they <laughs> added things in the background and, you know, Greedo shot first. No, Han shot first. Han shot first. No, I'm and sorry. Greedo have... shot first in the rem- in the, the re-release. The remaster. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. Or, and like, when E.T. New... came out and for some reason Spielberg thought it would be a good idea to erase all the guns and put walkie-talkies in all of their hands. I mean, that yeah. was funny. Mm-hmm. Like you, you remember yeah, that? That was dumb right as hell. Reasons. Yeah, I missed that. You didn't, you didn't see that. Dude, I think that happened ridiculous. while we were like right after college, maybe. Uh, I didn't realize it happened until I saw movie and South I Park making fun of it. Watched was done with it <laughs> for the most part. Yeah, like the guns weren't the scary part of ET. It was the dudes in the spacesuits busting into the house to steal ET that made me cry and run out of the room. Yeah. <clears throat> Nothing. Uh, <laughs> No, that that's traumatic. That's some Willy Wonka waterfall nonsense. Dude, when, when they are, when the kid is lying in the tent dying, I'm like, nope. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, yeah. Another more recent or more recently announced remaster that's been in the news uh, in the video game world is the Mass Effect Three, or the Mass Effect trilogy yeah. remaster. I don't know what its proper name Ooh. is. I am so buying that as soon as it comes out. See, Dirk knew what I was talking about. Yep. I've never played a Mass it's Effect on my game. Wish list already. And I don't oh, care. So Is it a video game? Yes. Yes. <laughs> oh my <Okay>. god. <laughs> three video games. It's three? It's In four if you count the one that Bill just finished not long ago. I like was, that one. Well, wait, know, okay. did, they they made a fourth one and had all these glitches, right? Like the, yes. the Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. I remember the glitches. <laughs> that that's what it, most people remember, yeah. It did get better eventually. Yeah. <laughs> so, that's a, so that's a remaster. So that's a remaster. Then there's Okay. Reboot and remake is where things get a little fuzzy. Yeah. Like they might actually be the same thing. It, eh. I like think a remake re- is like think the new Robocop movie. Where it's they're they're it's the same story essentially but they made some changes just because Mm -hmm. so the way i distinguish it and you can let me know if you agree with this or not a a remake 
is more like a a purposeful one shot kind of thing. And maybe they're hoping it'll turn into more one thing. But remake remakes a movie reboot to me has more of a feel of we're remaking this with the thought of doing more stuff down the line you're rebooting a continue a a continuity um a universe so to speak versus remaking an individual movie does that make sense am i am I... yeah that's I, the I distinction they make too yeah you remake my... robocop just because you want to remake robocop you reboot Spider-Man because you want to make more new Spider-Man movies with the there, new character. Right. Boom, it, it's boom. like he put it better than I could. So. Like a story versus like an entire setting and world. Right. Yeah. I was about to say because uh, Fuji in okay. the chat uh, just uh, made a good point. Remake is let's do the thing the same but with new tech. Reboot is let's take a different approach to this thing. Right. Like the the new Ghostbusters, mm-hmm. not the new mm-hmm. as an upcoming, but the most recent Ghostbusters movie was not a remake of the original Ghostbusters, but with women. It was a reboot. It was a, it was the same idea, but with a whole different uh, cast. Yeah. Oh, dude, I saw was... a, uh, I saw a, 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 a teaser for another, another new Ghostbusters. Yeah. Uh, it does not fill me with much hope. I mean, so. there hasn't been a good Ghostbusters trailer ever, so... Yeah, that's true. That's, that's probably that's a good true. sign. <laughs> I just know that anytime. Oh, well, sorry. Go ahead. Keep going. I'm well, idiot. then. Oh, and like the the live action Disney movies are are remakes. Yes. Yes. Excuse Those me. are remakes. It's just the same <clears throat> thing, done again, more modern. Yeah. Whereas, like for instance, like Lost in Space, that new series, I feel like that's more of a reboot. Right. Like yeah, to me, I doubt a they're reboot. Go back to the old scripts and just remake each episode. <laughs> <laughs> like what was that? Reboot to, me, reboot to me is like again. We had discussed about the Spider Mans that the Sam Raimi ones are. You know, if you were to consider that to be the original, then the reboot would be the ones like the Amazing Spider Man, where instead of uh, having oh god, what's the redhead's name? Mary Jane. Mary Jane. Mary Jane, you have Gwen <laughs> Stacy instead as the main heroine. I was going to yeah. say, I know, I, I, I had a brain fart for a moment. <laughs> but instead of uh, Mary Jane, Gwen Stacy is the main heroine of the series. Did you mean sure. to rhyme? Well, anyway, but these are awfully very close to each other. So, yeah. And then the, the final thing is uh, what I found out in the School of Movies Discord, is apparently called a legacy sequel. It's a sequel that happens way, 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 way later. Think, like, Creed. Creed was a legacy sequel. Because Rocky, what was that, Rocky Five, Rocky IV? Mm-hmm. It's, it's, it's a direct sequel to one of those. Like, it ignores Rocky Balboa, I think. <clears throat> but, like, Creed is a legacy sequel that came way, way, way later. Uh, Cobra Kai is what I've been watching lately. That's like the most obvious example because it's literally 35 years later. And then here, here's a new series with the same characters. What? Yeah. Streaming likes to do that. Yeah, because there's, you know, money in it. Which is a thing we'll get into. Uh, what's... Would, would oh, Star Trek The Next Generation count as a legacy sequel? Uh, Yeah. I would say so. Because it it's not a remake or a reboot. It's just more of the same that happens way later. And also way like, later chronologically in the in the series, but also chronologically for us. Like, yeah, the whole mm-hmm. batch of Next Generation, Deep Space Nine, like Voyager, all of those are still like same world. You yeah. can even like they do have cameos from original cast members. They did a movie where they paired them together. Yeah. Um, Whereas the fine. new Star Trek movie series, that's a reboot. Yes. Aha. Also, the, I think the most famous example of uh, legacy s- uh, sequels is actually the new Star Wars sequels. Because mm, mm-hmm. those are sequels that happen after movies from right. either the early 2000s or the the, the mid 80s, depending on how yeah. you want to count the sequel. Right. So, yeah. <clears throat> so there you go. That's that's just a brief overview of what each of these things are. We'll probably screw up. Oh yeah. Uh, oh, I plan to. Some of these, yeah. 
So, uh, how do we want to do this? We didn't, and all of this pre-show nonsense, we didn't actually talk about the structure of this episode. We were busy talking about LASIK and assorted nonsense. I mean, do we want to talk about what makes them good or bad? Or do you want to talk about why they would happen? Like, why would a studio decide to do this? Okay, yeah, Money. let's let's do that. Money, bingo. That is the yeah. number That's one. That's the easy one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That was because easy. it's got built-in recognition the problem with a new ip that's intellectual property is that nobody knows what the hell it is it may be amazing but you have to have people to sign off on it because whether we're talking about movies tv show or video games these projects usually are not made by one guy in a garage they are made by a team of people and people need money so you have to get someone to finance your project and if you uh, the studio was like, okay, we have enough money for three movies for X quarter, and they get 12 ideas. They're going to put their money toward the projects that they think will have the highest return. And maybe they want to diversify their portfolio, and they're like, okay, we're going to do two sure things and then one kind of experimental where we want to show that we've got an Oscar contender or whatever. But at the end of the day, they have to make money. Because money. Heck, the, even... Sorry, go ahead. It's the same reason why adapting books and everything else in the world is really popular in Hollywood. Like, they're not reboots of other movies, but if you find a thing that already exists and already has a lot of an audience built in, you've already got an idea of how to sell it. Yeah. Sure. And I, I, I thought maybe I should correct myself a little bit because even if you are the guy making this in your garage uh, i have a friend who owns uh a small um who wanted to make his own movie so he he makes horror films and he has an imd page and everything he's made a couple movies he's i'm i i should point out that money is not any less of an issue for him if anything it's even more so i feel like i got caught up in the like appealing to investors but if you're doing it yourself it's an even bigger issue so sorry go ahead I love how Brian gets hung up on things that are irrelevant to the conversation. Um, Absolutely. <laughs> but never mind getting signed off on it to get money, which is not the direction I expected, but to get people to go see it. Like, you can just say, like, okay, for instance, the thing that I've been watching lately is Cobra Kai, right? Yes. It's amazing. It's It's way better than it has any right to be. But if it's... If it was just a TV show about two opposing karate dojos, I would just keep flipping, you know? Mm -hmm. I I wouldn't even think to watch it, but because it's got that immediate, oh, The Karate Kid, I like those movies, or at least the first two, and then <laughs> Fair. That, makes, that gets me interested enough to actually click on it, and then if it's good, I'll keep watching it. Hey... And yeah, Chifuji just brought up the point I was about to make. It's the same reason we've gone back to Ravnica in Magic as many times as we have. Because Ravnica sells. It's true. And that's why we're probably never going back to Kamigawa as much as I personally would like to. Because Ravnica didn't sell. <laughs> Ravnica. Kamigawa didn't sell. Uh, if, you, if you want... A magic set to just be guaranteed to sell really well whether the meta that it uh causes is you know decent or crap is irrelevant it's got ravnica in the title that means you're gonna have the setting that people like you're gonna have the guild mechanics that people like boom there you go it's gonna sell the rest is sort of irrelevant as far as you know watsy and hasbro is concerned yeah there you go yeah um, I'm trying to think, I know there's something, some sort of either legacy sequel or, or remake or something that I watched not long ago that was obviously, uh, an original IP that had this, this, uh, other IP stapled to it. And no, it was obvious, but I, I can't think of um, what that was now. A lot of them are bad, but, um, like for instance, if I'm just going to hit some bad things here quick. Um, most people probably wouldn't be talking about or caring about 
yet another movie type thing about a girl who gets discovered on YouTube and sings a bunch of music. But when you attach Jim and the holograms to the title, everyone has an opinion. Oh yeah. That's a good one. <laughs> Doesn't mean it's good, but everyone has an opinion. They're now talking about this movie that you spent $8 on. Yeah. It's ready made um, buzz. Yeah. Um, I remember a few years ago, I was super disappointed when after like 20 years of waiting for more, we finally got more reboot and the reboot that we got was not at all reboot, but they had the rights to it. So they slapped some logos on it and said it was reboot. Um, the that's 90s reboot, the animated old, show. The old yeah. animated show. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's definitely a thing. Um, I feel like a lot of the time, like you're saying, like you'll see things that get sort of shoehorned into a bigger franchise. I really wish I could remember what the hell it was because it offended me. It was so bad. Gosh, I remember one like that. Um, there was a I think it was back around the time when I was in college. There was a very short lived Night Rider. And the night it premiered, I happened to be hanging around my parents' house. This must have been like in the summer or something and thomas and i were there i was like hey i think that uh night rider show is starting up tonight yeah let's check it out and i don't think we got through like the first 10 minutes of it Ouch. we were just like this is dumb as hell <laughs> that's, that's rough you, you'll note that this is a way that you can elevate something bad to something bad that people at least look at out of curiosity too <laughs> Yeah, because that's why uh, so many of these uh, like legacy sequels and reboots and remakes are bad because they're just there to make a quick buck. Right. Like, does anyone remember uh, that remake of Point Break? Nope. No. Maybe I heard of it. Exactly. Or like the Total Recall remake. I don't know anybody that saw that and liked it. Not nobody. I never I actually saw it. I remember seeing because... it. Do what? I remember seeing it and just going, okay, I understand that it's supposed to be a remake because the, the remake was done on Earth, but it would had to do, I believe, with like a borehole that was supposed to go through from one end of the Earth to the other. But it definitely did not take place on Mars. <clears throat> Ouch. with it and it didn't give the like the original recall was he he thinks you you kind of have this ambiguity of is he really like originally he was a secret agent or is he fantasizing he was a secret agent the re-release was he definitely was a secret agent he was def definitely somebody who was not that lifestyle and the whole process brought him back to his original life whereas the original one was could he or could he not because it all happened within the span that they said that it was supposed to happen within so like they kind of killed the ambiguity that was a lot of the fun right That's because i mean you you can watch the original one and until the end i mean even through the end there's a little bit of like could it have been and you could kind of see it either way so Huh. The new one definitely shoots that one in the foot. It's no, this is definitely was a fake. He was given a fake identity. This uh, and he has been living a fake life. His original world is what has been awakened. This is what's actually going on. Yeah, mm. it spells it out for you. According mm. to chat, the one the remake is closer to the book. Which mm. I mean, cool. <laughs> And, and, you know, that can be a very good thing, but ultimately it's about the story you want to watch. And sometimes getting away from the books is like, ah, why would you do that? And sometimes it lets you just strictly adhering to the book uh, doesn't always work. So I think this is one of those things where we'll have to acknowledge that we're probably going to talk about things in the context of this is the movie and there was a movie before with full acknowledgement that before both of those, there was a book. But most of the reason we're talking about them is because for most people, they're comparing movie to movie. Yeah. Like We know yeah. that if we start talking about The Shining, people are probably comparing a more recent Shining thing to the Kubrick movie, not to the original book. Because if we talk about adaptations, that's an entire other episode worth of discussion. 
Yep. Absolutely. Which might happen at some point. Hey. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> and just as a brief note that may or may not be that brief, of course, the same logic applies to video games. If you're going to, you know, some people really seek out the the third party, the, the indie game. But for most people, if they're like, you know, I want to play a platformer. Does it have Mario? That the Mario being in the game versus not being in the game is actually going to help people make a decision about whether or not to try that game. So yeah, because, brand loyalty is totally a thing, or brand, brand recognition brand, rather. Brand brand loyalty, brand brand recognition, but also if you're someone that like I've only ever played a good, I've only ever enjoyed Mario games. I've never ha- played a bad Mario game then you're going to be like, all right, you know, so. So, but really, like, that's, for all of these, I think it's easy to say that the reason to make it is the the brand recognition, which leads to hype and money, just without effort. Yes. Now, that's not the only reason for a bunch of these. Like I said about Cobra Kai, it's way better and more intricate and just entertaining then it has any right to be for something that looks like a quick, like, streaming uh, series uh, cash grab. Because it was originally on, like, YouTube Premium. YouTube which Red or no one yeah. cared about. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, I think... Um, I think the three more... people cared about it, but that's it. <laughs> I think, um, just to throw a, a contrasting example out there, um, Westworld on HBO yep. is absolutely... Mm a full-blown like remake retelling re everything of the original movie with and... Yul Brynner. The movie? Yes, the yeah. original movie was re- was pretty good. Yeah. No, well, I haven't but seen West the show is or the movie, so. amazing compared to it. Right, and that's the thing like I think for most of the people that walked into Westworld now, they hadn't seen that movie. So oh, Lord, that it was from the 60s, I want to say. It's I want to see the yeah, 70s or 80s. It, I think it's the 70s. Um, I've not wikied that recently. 73, yeah. Yeah. But like, that's one of those things where we're adapting an old thing, but we're not really benefiting from name recognition. And yet, it feeds into something that I think is really nice now, is because the nature of that show was a mystery box show, like what's happening what's going on what's really going on having an existing world out there for people to go digging into and start coming up with theories week to week feeds the hype the uh-huh. same way that marvel's doing right now with wandavision yeah where the nerds have a guess as to what's going on but they don't know but they've got you know 50 years of marvel comics to dig from and that keeps the speculation going it keeps the hype up it gives you a lot to play with So I think that there's a lot of power to having all that stuff out there, even if it's beyond the initial name recognition, just having more and giving people more when they want more without having to go invent it on your own. Exactly. Um, Like I said, money isn't, isn't always it. Sometimes it's actual uh, like artistic merit. Like Westworld is a great example of that because like Bill said, no one remembers this movie except for like me and my parents. (laughs) <laughs> another another reason that this happens and i i uh, wanted to kind of get past some of the money stuff is sometimes it is a passion project for someone yeah you, you don't see that as much or it doesn't get as much play uh now i know uh, she-ra I'm, I'm, i think falls into that yes. category the new she-ra which was, was totally Ultron uh, was also uh i well that one i don't know about so i'm, I'm only like one and a half seat one and a quarter seasons into it but like she-ra i know was a passion project for its creator uh and and you could tell that the the love that the the creators poured into it just oozes out of it it's so good so that was just an example keep going brian yeah oh no, no the, I, I was gonna give an example as well um I've mentioned once or twice in the show that I am a fan of Joss Wheaton's Buffy the Vampire Slayer series, ran for seven seasons, um, was by, I think, every benchmark a, a success. Uh, those of you that are old enough may remember that there was actually a Buffy the Vampire Slayer movie that came out a couple of years before, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. and it didn't do as well. 
but it kind of laid the groundwork. I, I don't think in all the interviews I've ever seen, I don't think we ever meant to be like, I'm going to make a movie and turn it into a show. The movie kind of gave him the kernels for of ideas for what then became the show. And he always said his inspiration for the movie and later the show was, you know, the girl in the horror movie that's always you know, the victim that's always running away and and is like the subject of, you know, oh, she needs someone to save her with some notable exceptions like in Halloween. I but don't think for... I ever realized Joss Whedon wrote the, the original film. Yep. Yeah. Huh. yeah. So and it did OK, but he's he's like, you know, I feel like there's more to this and obviously there was the movie was okay the show is an infinitely infinitely better quality uh but the movie's still kind of fun in a very campy sort of way so Which is how you tell it to warner brothers when they're launching a new network and that's important mm-hmm. the way that the movie looked made it possible to sell the show even though it wasn't as big a name recognition like it still ties in you're exactly right yeah. there you go and also it, had, it um, had paul rubens as a vampire who gets his arm uh, ripped off and, and it's it had, really uh, put out by that. Yeah. He's like, oh, 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 oh. And the characters are trying to continue talking. He's like, ugh. Um, and it had, uh, what's his face from Beverly Hills, now 210 or whatever. I didn't. Luke Perry. I didn't. Yeah, I didn't. Sadly watch now departed Luke Perry. That's right. Oh. Hmm. And so. Christy Swanson, who's apparently a right wing lunatic now. So maybe <laughs> don't go back and watch the original film. <laughs> no, but, but the show uh outstanding um not trying to convert anybody this episode uh maybe next episode but i agree uh shifuji mentions in the chat it was uh the show was a reboot and that's essentially what it is there are one or two allusions or references to the events in the first in the in the movie in the show but they largely just kind of put it in the corner and don't look too hard at it it gave so once again kind of going back to where i started this passion project for the writer and there was enough of a backing behind it to see it uh really uh take off does anybody else have another example of that i, I feel like those are a little harder unless you know the background of the material so um, the the example i want to give is battlestar galactica that was on my list yeah yeah. Yes, the original it, but... the original was. I mean, it, the the original was there were twelve um, colonies. It, it follows along the new series that the, the 20, 20, uh, 2005 series that it has the same history. Like, there's twelve colonies. They're wiped out. There's a there's a, a ragtag fleet of survivors that are trying to find their way to salvation. Blah blah blah. That the the 2000 so the the 1970 version is that, but I think it only lasted what like two seasons or so. You literally but it introduced have the internet in front of you. <laughs> yeah, it introduced a lot of really good characters to it, but the this it, it just kind of trailed off into its own world but the reimagining of it took that that framework and then reworked it into its own story and the story of the 2005 version is so much more in depth and the the thing that i really like is that there's this constant restating of this has happened before and will happen again so it's kind of like it's it's restating that yes the two the 2017 version or uh, sorry 2017 the the 20 uh 1970s version happened and then this version is the current version with potential for future versions happening uh in the future and that's what's kind of neat about that yeah one of the things that battlestar galactica did incredibly well was um and this is something that'll be a recurring theme as well um so as noted the original show was in the 70s what was the 70s a lot of camp sci-fi um that was how you sold sci-fi like there were good things in there but it was it was a bit more campy um but the 2000s we were more into political thrillers we were more into a little bit more gritty a little bit more like dark realism um you know 
politically in the world, we were all kind of scared and a lot of things had happened. And so the idea of let's reboot this old thing, because the the 2000s show started with a miniseries in like 2003. So Mm -hmm. think of America in 2003. Um, And then you open your show with the worlds that you live in getting nuked and you're on the run. And it just played heavily into the psychology of the time. And it doubled down and tripled down. And it had a very different tone from the original show. But everything that it was doing still drew on a lot of the original themes, just as a more serious primetime drama. And yeah, like as Dirk was mentioning, it's also fun because um, they changed it up so that in the new one, it was kind of like a there was a war a while ago and it ended and we've had a era of peace and now we're not and we're screwed and we've decommissioned our stuff and we have to make do with all this really old crap from the first war. So they got to have shout outs to the original show and whenever they would have flashbacks to the original war, like the robots were big and clunky and dumb, just like in the original TV show. And they really knew how to play just enough nostalgia for the people that remembered the original show without actually cutting out anyone who came in on the new one. Um, I think that's what a really good remake knows how to do. Mm-hmm. And th- there were so many things where the original show kind of just does its own thing. Again, it, it does. The original show may not have a, a focus, like something that it sort of it alludes to at the time. Whereas the, the remake there's a part, and I, and I don't know if it's the second or third season, where they, they found their little colony that they're like, oh, yeah, we'll, we'll stay here. It's not ideal, but we'll stay here. But then when the Cylons show up, it's the equivalent that when you look at it, the the directors, when they're doing it, are going, we wanted to sort of montage it to when the Nazis are walking through Paris. That they, you know, they're walking down and everyone's just going oh crap, these guys are here. No one's happy, but they're sort of walking down the the main avenue of Paris in triumph. And everyone's just sort of lined up going, okay, awesome, you guys are coming down. We didn't want you here, but you know what can we do about it? That you were able to layer those, um, those references on top of the series that you kind of... Uh, are seeking a, an emotional level, an emotional uh, resonance with. And that's sort of a neat thing is that you have the original series where here's this cool idea. And then you have the remake where it's, yeah, we're taking this original idea. We run off in our own direction. And then we're going to take things that have happened since then. And we're going to layer them on top and say, we want you to, um, we want you to feel this and we're going to layer something on top of it that makes you go, Let we can relate this to this event and give you an experience of, oh, I want to feel this, or I want to feel that with that moment. And for the original series, that may not have been there at that time. But since the remake has come around, it's or the a reboot, I guess, it's it's come around and you're and you have a more personal connection with that. Okay then. I agree. Um, Just to clarify. (laughs) I didn't want to leave you hanging too long there, but I I wanted to make sure that other people got a chance to talk to. Hey Mike, we haven't heard from Mike in a while. Um yeah, we hadn't yet. I think <laughs> um, it's hard to tell where we left off. <laughs> what, we're jumping we're, a bit. Are we talking about what makes something good or what makes something bad? Or we're talking what? about why they get made in the first place. I think why they get made. In the first, yes. I mean, we could probably stop that now. I, I think we've covered it pretty well. Do you have anything you want to add? Um, I guess not. <laughs> since I had no <laughs> idea where we were in the conversation. Fair enough. So, Mike, what would make you want to watch a reboot? If it looks like someone actually cared when they were doing it. Because sometimes it's, I get the feeling like it's really easy to get the vibe of whether someone was just doing it because someone was just doing it to attract, um, you know, the money from the built-in fan base and weren't interested in 
telling it, you know, an interesting story. So um, your your perception of their motivation is a factor. Yes, because that my perception of their motivation colors my thoughts about um, how well crafted I think it will be. Yeah. Okay. And someone also, who really cares is going to try to write a good story and uh, cast appropriate actors for the roles and, you know, get someone to direct them effectively. Exactly. Someone who just wants to keep the license for something like Sony does with Fantastic Four every now and then. Oh, no. oh poor, poor, poor friend. Wait, no, that yeah. was that was Fox. Because oh, now Disney Fox? owns okay. it. Right? Uh-huh. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Disney got back. Okay. Um, well, that's yeah. That's the why properties oh. and the Fantastic Four properties. Yeah. Yeah, of the four Fantastic Four movies that were ever made, two of them were only made to hold on to the rights. The original that was never released by Roger Corman, and then the last one, the Fan Four stick, that was uh, poop. Bad. Yeah, at least the ones with uh, Jessica Alba were trying to have fun. The, I think they were, they were riding pretty well off of the resurgence of superhero movies before the MCU actually yeah. established standards. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So uh, another thing is whether or not we feel like a movie needs a reboot. Yes. Like, and, and the ones that I mentioned before, Point Break, Total Recall, mm-hmm. Robocop, those all came out within just a few years of each other, I think. And no one cared about any of them. <laughs> my, because my Point go- Break and RoboCop and Total Recall didn't need reboots; they were still fine. Yeah, yeah. You need something. You need a source where there's something like really rich that you could go in. You have a lot of room to explore different angles on. I mean, my go-to for this is sorry, but The Amazing Spider-Man, because when they announced that they were making it, I'm like just had spider-man 3 we just did it okay we're doing another oh no we're not doing another one we're doing a reboot we're recasting we're starting over we're starting with the spider bite from get day one and to me it felt like i don't know i'm gonna look this up because i have the internet right in front of me as a wise man once said thank but god the, the, <laughs> but the distant but the time between spider-man 3 and the amazing spider-man did not feel that long it was, it was short like, it was not. It was not ten uh, years. It was less than ten years. Amazing was twenty twelve, and Spider Man three was oh seven. So it was five years. F- yeah, it was five, five years. years. Yeah, it was rough. Yeah, regardless well, of the quality of one or the other, felt like wow, we're doing this now. Okay. It was a bad decade to be Uncle Ben. <laughs> oh man, well, and I don't blame him thing. for sitting out of the MCU. <laughs> yeah, he's just the like thing- I'm done. The thing I liked was when they did uh, Homecoming was we've we've already had two movies that were sort of an origin story. And we're not going to do an origin story. We're just going to drop you right in and say, he's already been bit. He's already been a local superhero. And we're just going to pick up from there and just take it in terms of the MCU and Spider-Man and so on and so forth. And I think that was, that was a really good choice yeah. on... Uh, well, yeah. Kevin Feige and all, and all their parts in was... that particular case there's no need we know the origin story we know we know yeah. Jesus but do we do we <laughs> I, so... I like things like that you know it's Spider-Man you know who Spider-Man is okay here's Spider-Man yeah and that's why I, I hope see Superman getting launched from how the planet he got his powers time. so and like I hope that uh, as as a tangent, I hope when they do work the Fantastic Four in, I hope they don't get an origin story. I hope the Fantastic Four just appear in other movies and we know who they are. Yeah. I would love if they just rolled in and as a cameo in the Guardians of the Galaxy movie. They wave at each other and then we're like, okay, they'll be back later. We're good. Yeah. We're fine. But what, like, What's your backstory? Cosmic Race. Cool. We got it. Like when they did a new Hulk movie. We didn't really need to know the Hulk's origin story again. Here's the Hulk. Go. Go do Hulk things. Yeah. Like, it was told in the credits, the opening credits, in, like, piecemeal, because you know the the origin story. 
And like, that's the thing. Like with with the RoboCop reboot, we know the deal. You don't have to to give us a new origin story. But another problem with the RoboCop reboot, RoboCop. One of RoboCop's like. And this is speaking as someone who just watched it not long ago as part of a watch party, which you do on Saturdays if you have Amazon Prime, then you mm-hmm. can link that to your Twitch account and come watch movies with us uh, on Saturday nights. Me and Steph usually uh, watch movies and you guys can watch with us. Plug. But we watched Robocop as part of uh, a watch party one night. And part of its deal is one, social commentary. So much. And two, gore. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, one of the notes that I actually had specifically for RoboCop was the difference when you do your remake of going from an R-rated movie to a not R-rated movie. Exactly. And that can make such a big difference. So, And especially when the over-the-top violence of the original RoboCop film, I'm ignoring the sequels, uh, because 3 was god-awful and 2 sort of kind of lost the plot. But the original especially... The the over the top violence was part of the social commentary. It was necessary for the theme of the film. It wasn't gratuitous. Uh, it was it was the point. Yeah, like between that and the I'd buy that for a dollar guy. Like there was <laughs> there was all this social commentary mixed up in it. Best now, scene. <laughs> well, I, so one of the things that made RoboCop effective was that it knew what it was doing. That's why you get all of the random commercials while you're watching the movie. They're like, yeah, this is beating you over the face with what happens with a world of completely unfettered capitalism where companies run everything. This is what you get. You get a literal company run cop who can and will shoot people. Like, that's what you get. That's where we're going. You can't make that a PG-13 story. I mean, that would be like remaking Starship Troopers, but actually making it a serious oh. sci-fi movie, like, you know, without all the political commentary, without the, do you want to know more things? Because that was the point of the movie, was watching how people, like, react to this stuff. It would be like, okay, go into video games. Everybody knows The Legend of Zelda, the original one, and you know how well-received Zelda 2 was? Because it changed... It, it, you all of a sudden now you leveled up with experience and you had the side scrolling, but you had the world map and it felt very different. And as someone that enjoys both, I enjoy both versions. I have to admit the two, like if they had, if they had called the second Zelda game, like asterisk, the legend of Bibbly Bob then, and not tied it to the Zelda franchise, oh, it still right. would have made as much sense the so, Japanese title, got it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, point being, when you shift formats too much, and I think part of that is you go from R to PG-13, or, God forbid, PG to R. I don't know how that would work. Um, or you change the, the, the tone in a, such a way that you lose what made, what the, the feeling of the original one. Then, yeah. 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 And and sometimes and that's that's one of the things another thing that RoboCop is catching all the hell here. Now, so <laughs> I never actually saw the RoboCop reboot because I never heard anything positive about it at all. So, um, if I'm being totally honest, when I heard there was going to be a RoboCop reboot, I'm like, "Oh, okay, they're going to do that with new special effects." Like, I'm going to kind of miss the stop motion, but whatever. It's fine. Then I saw it was PG-13 and I'm like, "Well, I have no reason to watch this." Exactly. That, completely eliminated any because i knew that wouldn't be the point like if they decided this is a movie that we want to fill with just enough stuff to be edgy to 14 year olds then i'm like well then it's not going to be what i want like i i want commentary i want something out of this because like i could watch any number of incredibly violent gore movies i don't (laughs) like it has to mean something and it's not going to do that in a pg-13 remake like if i wanted watered down robocop i'd go back to the tv show like, oh man, yeah. yeah. But like now, another thing with the reboot is sometimes they like like again, RoboCop is catching this. Sometimes they just miss the point. Yeah. Like, uh, I'm trying to think. I'm looking at my list here, trying to find one that actually missed the point as bad as as RoboCop. 
and I'm I'm sort of not. So maybe that's not the the best. Uh, I've got I've got down Man of Steel, where you know, uh, it just it does not feel like a fun. Actually, I think that's a good one. Um, I think Man of Steel is a good example of that because, for like I'm gonna make broad statements here because it's the nature of discussing Superman in any context. Sure. Um, For most people, the point of Superman is that he is a paragon of good. He is the entity that exists. For everyone else to look up and go, that is the hero, that is a savior, that is someone who is better than us, and we should want to be like them. The ideal. Um, like He's whether Jesus or not that, yeah. yeah, whether or not he can live up to that is the actual story. Like that's the interesting part of Superman. Like can he actually live up to the role that he's taken here? But when you make a movie that's just a guy who is sad, who is avoiding responsibility the entire time, and then when he finally decides to be a hero, can't even make it one movie without snapping someone's neck, that's not the Superman people showed up for. You hit it on the head. <laughs> like, that's um, not why we're there. And then when you go a step further with, like, Batman versus Superman, that's not what you want out of your Batman either. Yeah. Like, we have ideas. Um, uh, so Bill hit on a lot of the stuff I wanted to say, which is good on Bill. Um, I, not to necessarily steal from everybody else's ideas, but um, Honest Trailers. Anyway, it's not familiar with them. They're a YouTube channel. It's awesome because they give you little like if uh, a little trailer for the movie if the movie was being honest. Now they're like seven to ten minutes long, so because they pull things apart. But I love the one for Man of Steel because at one point they're they're listing all this gritty stuff and they're and the announcers like because God forbid anybody should have any fun watching a Superman movie <laughs> and it just kind of made me go like yeah. Because one of the things about like the Christopher Reeve movies and how he's portrayed in comic books is, you know, we should be able to have fun with this. Even if like Christopher Reeve, sometimes it's over the top goofy and he's rebuilding the wall of China with his laser eyes. Because sure, but it's it's fun. It's supposed to be. And that movie is so anti-fun. It's ridiculous. Well, I mean, that's um, Sex Snyder's entire <clears throat> filmography yeah, it's a- thing. And, and, and that's so uh, and then I wasn't going to necessarily go into Dawn of Failed Justice or any of that stuff. But since Bill pointed out, I, I heard someone put it and I cannot recall who made the statement. They said that Zack Snyder really, really, really wants to make an evil spy, uh, an evil Superman movie. And he can't he doesn't quite have like they won't let him do it but the way that he writes these movies feels like when you look at what superman is doing he's like right on the edge of that and not in a like clever like will he won't he but it's really like you almost see the intent of the director and the writer to be like go a little further yeah go and it's it, like it, he really it, wanted to adapt the boys and just couldn't get the rights there there you go as someone that's now seen both seasons of the boys i agree completely so missing the point like chewie said missing um, the point point. and then while we're on superman uh it's brought up in the chat the superman returns was a legacy sequel yeah. that showed up yeah. and tried to ignore the previous two sequels which happens right. a lot. Like the most yeah. recent uh, Halloween movie was a sequel to like, Halloween Two mm-hmm. mm-hmm. that completely ignored everything up to that point, and including up to and including the reboot. <laughs> I think. I think though. I think that happens a lot with horror movies uh, because horror movies, especially the ones in the eighties, when you've got like. Uh, jason x you know jason in space goes to hell in manhattan or whatever some of the entries are just gonna be some of the entries are gonna be better than others when you have jaws 12 so at some point you're like we had it right up until 13 you know 20 was just a piece of crap so let's just ignore that one so i feel like that one happens yeah frequently I think because, the Terminator movies do that too. They're like, yeah, there were two Terminator movies. There were like five. There were two Terminator movies. Everything will be a sequel to Terminator 2. And yet okay. they still keep making them, which is just... Yeah, how many sequels has Terminator 2 had now? Like Terminator 3 was a sequel to it. I'm pretty sure Dark Fate was a sequel to it. Was one of those others a sequel Sal- to it too? Sal- Salvation was kind of... Well, no, Salvation was more a sequel to 3. But 
I, I, the TV I, show is a sequel to two. If you I, want the example, oh, yeah. the Highlander series is an example. There's oh, only God. one movie. What are you talking about? Because <laughs> it was uh, like a movie and a TV Highlander show. Highlander movie. <laughs> then there was the TV show, Highlander two, Highlander three. Each one of those was their own sort of. Like if you say Highlander, the movie was the 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 main thing. They each created their own alternative universe. That you could be like, oh yeah, Highlander two, and you could just kind of go off in that direction. Or the show, you went off in that direction. And I think four was in the show universe, and so on and so forth. Yeah, and three ignored two. Yes. Yeah. Multiple of them yeah. ignored the other universes. Two got completely ignored. It's good. Two made the sky red. You don't want to explain <laughs> that. <laughs> Nobody wants to explain that every movie. Like. So let's, that's actually an example of a movie deciding in its sequel that it's going to go really, really, really far and no one has anything left to play with, so they ignore it. Exactly. <laughs> so let's let's go back real quick to the Disney live-action uh, remakes. Yeah. So all of these... Now, admittedly, I have seen zero of them because I have better things to do with my time, like sort my socks. Uh, and if you like them, that's fine. You're allowed to like things that are bad. It's fine. Uh, and I'm not even saying they're bad. I'm saying that they're pointless. Like they're they're literally the Disney going. We need more money. Chugga 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 chugga. And they turn out this ver that's this slightly updated version of an old classic that quote unquote fixes some of the quote unquote problems with the originals. Like in the case of Dumbo, there's like some messages in there that are sort of half-assed and half-hearted and aren't actually good messages but they're messages that aren't just make fun of people with big ears and then racist crows you, you notice how most of the attempts for disney to fix their problems boils down to you know all these things that made us all of our money and fame those were bad give us money to watch us say they were bad <laughs> Yeah, but none of them have, like, become new classics. Like, the only one that anyone I've ever heard say anything positive was the f one of the first ones, was Cinderella. People right. were like, that was a really good telling of the Cinderella story. That was really good. And, like, I guess technically you could count uh, Maleficent. Yeah, That's a, re because... a remake, a reboot. I, but... I, sorry, go ahead. Well, I was just saying that that's a retelling of the story from a different perspective, which is very different from yeah. sort of what we're, what the, the reboots or like I, I, the modern retellings of the story, yeah. I guess. So uh, my take on these is I have seen pretty much all of them because I'm a, in a Disney family yep. and some of them I, I like, and some of them, not as much. And the I find that the that the closer they are to a strict retelling, with some with some exceptions, the less I like it. Uh, Beauty and the Beast played it pretty close, but I was just very impressed with a lot of the stuff they could do. So I was like, all right, I'm I'm okay with that. I I liked I saw it in the theater with Mike actually, and I thought we came away with a fairly positive experience. Um, Cinderella, I agree with Chewy. And Maleficent, I'll tell you what, I liked Maleficent 2, Mistress of Evil, better than the first one because the first one was, as Dirk said, a retelling. They kind of set up this al basically alternate reality. Movie 2, they didn't have to retell the same story just in a different way. They were like, okay, we made this new world. What are we going to do with it? And it just felt maybe kind of going back to what we're talking about as a whole because it didn't feel like it had to have the sleeping beauty you know like you know a star wars movie but you don't have to have like star wars it's just a space movie then you don't have that expectation and i i honestly enjoyed it my least favorite of all of them probably by a mile has been lion king because it it was beat for beat for most of the movie and then they added some things that i did not care for um when did that movie come out three uh, four years ago something like that. yeah okay so minor spoiler alert because 
you know, and it gets so close to the original one that came out like 20 years ago that shouldn't have to be a spoiler at, at this point. It's closer but, to 30 at this point. Yeah. So you, you know how Simba, like after he's grown up, he like lays down in the grass at the Oasis and it like sends up a puff and that puff makes its way to Rafiki and Rafiki's like, he's alive. You remember that? Yeah. In in the remake, it, part of that grass or whatever gets caught and ingested by some animal and excreted and some dung beetle picks it up and is rolling it around and then it breaks apart. And I'm just thinking what a perfect analogy for what I'm watching. <laughs> no. It was just so on point. It's important yeah. to realize that someone decided that was worth $50,000. It like, I, yeah. <laughs> to make that I, scene happen. I'm, I'm literally watching it and I'm like, this is either just another attempt at potty humor for the kids, or this is the most self-aware cinema I've ever seen in my life. Yeah, for I me, was... that movie didn't work. That, that movie didn't work as well because the medium didn't work as well. Mm -hmm. With mm -hmm. the with the photorealistic animals, you don't get as much of the play and and flexibility and emotion the, the touches of yeah, yeah touches of emotion yeah. that you can have from being able to you know uh, anthropomorphize a you know a, a cartoon character more so it's hard uh, to connect with the characters you're just watching a bunch of you know talking animals walk around which is interesting but it's been a long time since i was last interested in sitting down and watching milo notice or something like that <laughs> and, and i agree with you to a certain extent but counterpoint the live action jungle book i enjoyed but that was right. once again that's the other one that i hear positive yeah. things about it I haven't seen it yet. It, it did not adhere as well, almost at all. Uh, I think it was probably more like the original book oh, that um, I don't know that I ever read versus. Like book? Yeah, I yeah. think, but I don't know that I read it. So don't take, you know, don't, don't take that terribly seriously, but that one had, yeah. uh, had the same sort of digital uh, animals, but um, I thought it was done better but personal preference perhaps so that that kind of gets us into like can a movie a remake be so close to the original that it becomes as chewy said pointless there was a horror film cabin fever that had the kid from boy meets world not the one but the other one um right writer strong i think and it was not great, but it was it was okay. And then they like remade it five or six years later, and they remade it like plot point A to plot point Z nearly unchanged. And it's like why? And I think I read on uh, online that it was basically just the director was like. I wanted to do it again. So, so they yeah. did. Like, one, of the, one of the worst offenders for this is the infamous shot for shot remake of Psycho. Yes. Mm -hmm. that that is, is, it's the That's first version of Psycho I saw, I'm sad to say. And mm. there were a few changes. Like, for instance, okay, you remember in the original when uh, he looks through the peephole or the hole in the wall and sees uh, the, 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 uh, the actress. I, I can't remember the character's name, but he sees her changing and he's just sort of looking through the, the hole in the wall and then he covers it up again and walks away. In the remake, when he looks through that, you hear this. That's not better. Because... Instead of just implying that he was enjoying himself, you hear him jerking off. And I was like, oh, because I was watching this remake with my mother. And I went, oh, and she goes, that wasn't in the original at all. I went, thank goodness. <laughs> I, I don't see Hitchcock feeling the need to do that. That's something no. that comes up sometimes with, with remakes. The loss of subtlety. But the like, it like was... It was, it was at, there was no reason for it because it was a, as I said, a shot for shot remake. And they were very proud of the fact that it was a shot for shot remake, which means you could just watch the original 
and be better off. <laughs> I think that's the biggest thing for me, period, when it comes to a remake, is it has to give me something that the original didn't. Um, that's exactly. Why, what we were talking about before, Battlestar Galactica gave me so much that the original didn't. That was great. I didn't foresee RoboCop giving me things that the original RoboCop didn't, other than, I guess, a guy with two hands. Um, like, that wasn't really going to get there for me. <laughs> like, that doesn't make me watch a movie. Now, like, um, to go a slightly more obscure, I love the John Wayne movie True Grit. It is, in fact, the only John Wayne movie that I've ever watched and liked and and watched again, like, at some point in my life. It's really good for a John Wayne movie. If you don't like John Wayne movies it's the one that I'd recommend you give a shot. Uh, the remake, True Grit, with the dude as uh, Rooster Cogburn, the, the John Wayne character, it's the same story, but it's a, well, one, it's a Coen Brothers movie. Right? Mm -hmm. That's right, right? Yeah, I think so. True Grit, 2010. Da, 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 da. Yeah, Coen Brothers. Okay, good. Uh, so it's got the Coen brothers, like weird style that the, they do, which helps, but also it changed. Well, it, it keeps the ending that's closer to the source material. And there are a few other like smaller changes. Like the, the girl is much younger uh, in, in the remake, which changes a lot of things going on. And, uh, the ending is completely different and there's just more there to chew on. It's also less, you know, happy, uh, original w Western thing. You know what I mean? Like Westerns are all the, the wild West has been whitewashed and it's all happy and friendly unless there's engines about, Oh Jesus God. So yeah. It's uh, it's it's the same story, but it, there's enough different about it to be worth watching. And I, in fact, I really like uh, the remake as well. But then you've got like uh, Footloose, which the original Footloose, it's so bad, but I love it. I love it. I will never watch the remake because mm. it's the same thing. Again, I assume some of the songs are different. <laughs> and if there's anyone in chat who's seen it, it's like, well, actually, it's it's got this and this that are different. Well, they should have, like, made that more clear because it looks like it's literally the same movie again. And why would I watch that? When the original holds up. Plus, it's got Kevin Bacon in it. Hey. He John Lithgow, everything. man. John Lithgow, come on. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, what is this? Oh, it's a piece of fuzz. Oh my God. There's something black on my shoulder. And I was like, oh. <laughs> okay, sorry. Uh, <laughs> uh, to get away from movies for a minute, uh, I keep bringing up She-Ra. Mm -hmm. So the only things that cross over from the original She-Ra to the new one are character names and like the very basic skeleton of the story, which is there's Hordak. That's the bad guy. There's the rebellion that are rebelling and trying to take back their world from Hordak. Who's the bad guy. And there's someone who works for Hordak named Adora who ends up being the good guy. Character names are the same. That's about it. Everything else is completely new. Like all the character relationships are new. The character personalities are new. The visuals are completely overhauled. The dog was shaking. The, uh, wait, uh, <laughs> it was uh, a new the, shake. The stories that it's telling are completely different. And there's another reason for that as the, as time has passed. A lot of these old cartoons, because uh, the first several things on my list of remakes in TV were cartoons. That's because back then, 
cartoons were like either serialized or, or not serialized. What's the word? Um, syndicated. Syndicated. Or Saturday morning. So you had you couldn't have a running story. Yep. Like you had to always go back to the status quo at the end of every episode, so that the next episode, someone could just pick up and watch. But nowadays, with streaming services and whatnot. You don't have to do that anymore, so you can tell deeper, more meaningful stories. And so Shira back in the day was syndicated nonsense where the, the the events of one episode didn't matter for literally any other episode. Once you get past that initial, I guess it was a movie, actually. I think it was a theatrical movie, The Secret of the Sword. You establish the status quo, and then you live in it forever. Exactly. And then and nothing changes off your main character. Yeah, nothing changes, ever. And that's why... Uh, She-Ra is so good. The remake of uh, Masters of the Universe uh, from the early 2000s was so good. That one, slightly less for that reason. Uh, I'll get into more of that later. Thundercats! The, the remake from Cartoon Network that only got one season and then ended in the middle of the story. <sighs> was so good because it wasn't syndicated or Saturday morning. You could tell a story that people had to follow along. It still had episodic like stuff, but things that happened would be referenced later. Um, hang on, there was another one. Oh, DuckTales! The original DuckTales mm -hmm. came on after school, and there, were, there weren't long storylines, because there just couldn't be. But uh, from what I understand, I think Brian has watched these, right? Was it you? It was me. Uh, definitely uh, well, me I, too. Yeah, okay. I have started them, and... Yeah, I was I was actually going to talk about this a little bit and just just briefly, but I enjoyed the original one. I really truly did, but I think this may be a superior product. Maybe that's from where I am in my life right now, but we were watching uh after uh, while we were eating dinner and we're coming to what I think to what I think is the end of season 1 and uh we were about to start another episode because we had time for one more before we had to come up and sam's like oh look it's it's a it's a two-parter or it's a part one i'm like oh nope we're not doing that uh so but it's uh it's been really enjoyable and and some of the like i don't want to make it sound like these these ducks i have a huge investment in but like actual story progression and emotional uh beats to it so i'm like wow yeah yeah and part of that is because of the nature of television these days what with i mean this is out of date now but what with tivo and the ability to record shows to watch at your leisure you can afford to have ongoing storylines and whatnot which i assume ducktales has yep yeah mm -hmm. yeah you'll notice that um for modern television, they don't spend nearly as much time recapping what happened in previous episodes. Um, because this was a trend well through the 2000s where characters would repeat things that you know, usually in the guise of catching up another character who wasn't present last episode. Yeah, And they did this constantly so people could tell what was going on when you were watching it week to week and you didn't look up what happened if you forgot and you weren't binging it. Because you might not remember what happened last week if you're mm -hmm. catching it live you might have gone to the bathroom and missed it they were constantly recapping things and it's really obvious when you're binging old shows now but yeah modern tv shows just assume you'll look it up or you'll rewind and pause it yeah or assume that you've already watched three in a row <laughs> yeah <laughs> yep <laughs> and that's that's awesome because it allows reboots uh like it's, this works especially well with tv shows because the the writers can sink their teeth in and actually make something new and special uh, about it, rather than just, hey, look, it's the same thing before. Like with a movie, sometimes there's you just can't do that. Like, did anyone see the remake of The Day the Earth Stood Still with Keanu Reeves? Nope. Exactly. <laughs> I think I did. But the fact that I'm not 100% sure is telling. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I think I did, though. And it, it, it was eh. But, eh. Unnecessary. Didn't need to happen. <laughs> like, I, I was talking earlier with, uh, about, uh, with somebody. I just recently watched Tron. 
again on Disney Plus, the original. And it's not good. Is that good? It didn't okay. age well. It's not even that it didn't age well. It's not a good movie. Like, the special effects for at, at the time were crazy good, but as a movie itself, it's kind of whatever. Like, all the characters just sort of go through the motions and everything that happens, Everyone, no one questions it. Like, even when Flynn wakes up in the Tron world, he's like, oh, this is weird. And then within a few minutes, he's like, right, I'm in here, let's do this. I'm going, what? The story is a vehicle for the special effects. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Now, I still love it. It's still awesome. But it's it's not good. But I, I saw Tron Legacy. I'm pretty sure I saw Tron Legacy in the theater. I don't remember anything about Tron Legacy at all. I never saw it. Only then something about a, DA, a digitally de-aged uh, Jeff Bridges. And even that, I'm only vaguely aware of. Like, it doesn't, it didn't stick in my head. I meant to take the time to rewatch it earlier today to use it as more of an example. And then I thought, if I don't remember anything about it, I'm not going to waste two hours of my life to try to squeeze it in just for this podcast because it'll probably be a footnote at best. Like, Dirk, yeah. I'm sure you saw Tron Legacy, right? Absolutely. Do you have any in- input about it? <laughs> It's <laughs> good talk. <laughs> the fact that you're like, it wasn't terrible, but it was, it was like, they were, they were like, we want to, to add more to the story. And I'm sure that they're like, I know that there's supposed to be a third Tron movie that they were wanting to do, but because the second one didn't do great, They've held off on doing a third one. It just... I don't think it lived up to the, pers- the what they hoped it would do. Yeah, but I don't care what they hoped. Like, what did you think? Because yeah. I, I literally don't remember. I just know that I saw it. And that's as far as I can get. It, it, it definitely was its own story. With some parts of it that related to the original version but again it's tron so it's supposed to have the hero tron as sort of the one of the main characters with with what he does but he makes such a little appearance that it really should have just been called the first one should have been tron the second one should have just been called flynn <laughs> that makes sense so <laughs> i haven't seen really the movie, what but what you're happened. saying makes sense <laughs> but like that's that's my point it didn't it didn't do enough for it did not whatever add reason. To the experience, yeah, sufficiently, yeah. yeah. And that's um, that's too bad. Whereas a, a legacy sequel that came way later, like Creed, every I still haven't seen Creed. It pisses me off. It's only because it's never streaming anywhere that I have to pay for. But Creed, everyone loves Creed, and everyone's like, "Holy crap, this movie's amazing!" Yes, and I'm like, "What?" Because it's another Rocky movie, except it's not a Rocky movie. It's Creed. Rocky's just there. I'm like, oh, but <laughs> like, I don't know if anyone else has watched all the Rocky movies, but I've seen one through five, and one and two are pretty good. And after that, they get weird and weird. And if five was god awful, I didn't see. I did see Rocky Balboa, and I remember being impressed by it, but that was only in reference to five, which was god awful. <laughs> <laughs> So, like, when Creed came out, I went, I'll just skip that. And it turns out it's amazing, and I didn't see it, and now I'm pissed. But that's one that came way later that had a better story to tell and did it right. And it just, I, I can't put my finger on possibly because I haven't seen it, but I can't put my finger on why that one worked where Tron Legacy didn't. And it could just be as simple as Tron Legacy is not a good movie. And so the Tron part is irrelevant to this equation. Uh, like I haven't seen Tron Legacy, but you know, I was a kid. If at all, I, Tron might've actually come out before I was born. I don't remember. I saw it when I was a kid um, on the, like the Disney channel or something, but the point of Tron when it came out was, 
look at all this cool stuff. Can you imagine this crazy new idea that you're in a video game? Tron was 82. 82. So it was before I was born. Yeah. Neat. Um, so that was a crazy new idea that, you know, 20 something years later isn't a crazy new idea anymore. You have to do something new with it. You have to really build off of that and integrate it into what we would consider cool now. Like, it, one of the things that I'm going to be curious about for, like, coming out, I think, later this year or next year or whatever, what does a Matrix movie look like now? After, I'm so terrified of that. Are they making a new one? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah they are. What? Um, right. That's and It's the Wachowskis. Yeah. So it's not like someone else is making a new Matrix movie. The Wachowskis are making a new Matrix movie. Okay, but like, what does the Matrix sure movie look like right now? now. <laughs> like, I don't know what to expect because, for starters, every action movie that came after the first Matrix movie was trying to be the Matrix for a really long time. It, it's true. And the Matrix was kind of the modern cyberpunk sci-fi story. And since the Matrix came out, like for starters, more people have the internet. And now we actually can buy VR stuff and we are way more used to video games. And there's so much stuff that was cool and neat and, you know, honestly pretty edgy um, from the whole trench coats and big guns things that you can't really do anymore. Um, stuff from oh yeah exactly the late 90s that made up the Matrix. And the idea of just jumping back into that later, like, I don't know what to expect. They have to come up with something. It can't just be more and then Neo is Superman or Jesus or Super Jesus Man or whatever. Like, they have to do something new with it. And I don't know. Evil Superman. Evil Superman. Oh, God. Right. Somebody, oh. quick. Somebody put Snyder in a cage. Yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> Lock him. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, according to but, chat, it's supposed to come out this year. Oh, God. Yeah. Supposed to. I mean, the concept of a movie with a launch date is pretty ambiguous right now. But yeah, that's true. Um, yeah, like that's the thing though. Like that's something that Hollywood has to think about every time they dig these things out. Like if you're not careful, you'll dig something out and not actually have a good idea to run with it. And even if you try your best to do something new, if it doesn't work, people hate it. Like not many people care for Crystal Skull. Like fourth Indiana Jones movie came 20 years after the third Indiana Jones movie. And they did decide intelligently, let's try to do something different. Let's not make it Indiana Jones versus the Nazis again. Let's set it a little bit later because he's older. Let's go against Russians. Instead of having weird mystical, you know, ancient relic stuff or biblical stuff, we'll go with aliens. And they're like, they changed a bunch of things. They tried to keep it, but it didn't work. And, yeah. and, but I don't think any of the problem with that, looking back on it, was the Indiana Jones part. I think it was just not a good movie. Yeah. Yeah. Like, it, like there are two tiers of Indiana Jones movies. There's one and three, which is the top tier, and there's two and four, which is the bottom tier, and that's just how it is. <laughs> yeah. That means if they do another one, hopefully it'll be good, right? Because odd numbered indie movies are the best. They're like the anti Star Trek. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but another legacy sequel that again I haven't seen, but I've heard literally nothing but positivity about is the brand new uh, Bill and Ted Face the Music. Like they did Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, and then there was Bogus Journey, and then yeah. there were like 30 years, and Face the Music just came out last year. Too much acclaim. Again, I haven't uh, watched it yet, so I can't speak to it personally, but the reaction to it has been just ridiculously positive. And apparently it's because uh, the creators got the point of the original two movies and just moved that point forward to today instead of trying to just do a cash in and Hey, remember these characters? Yeah. And that's, that's good. Yep. I think the gold standard for, uh, uh, remakes though is one that so many people don't even know is a remake <laughs> and it's the thing. Like John What's Carpenter's The Thing, yeah, is uh, it's actually the first thing on my list. The first The Thing on my list, because it's a remake of an old ass like fifties. I want to say The Thing from Outer Space, which 
if you say if you uh watch i forget whose review it was it's a movie about people opening and closing doors because in every scene someone opens a door and walks in and then turns around and closes the door behind them and that's just yeah the whole I, movie. I played resident evil i know how this works yeah <laughs> that's how you load the level but it's it uh, for anyone that hasn't seen uh the remake you know there's a an alien thing that can take the form of someone else so the whole movie is about paranoia about not knowing well i know i'm good but i don't know you're it's like among us but for in 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 for reals uh because you could totally be a horrible creature that's going to kill me and when i go to shock you like i think you're dying and i go to shock you with the paddles your chest opens up into teeth and bites my arms off as you do yeah spoilers i, I guess for for among us uh, it's, really pretty old movie. it's pretty much yeah but and ocean like remakes aren't a new thing like oceans 11 from i think 99 is a remake of an old uh rat pack movie yeah yeah with sinatra and whatnot and it turns out it's not which one you saw first because i saw the original first and i was like that was pretty good you know it was, it was all right and then I saw the 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 new one, and I went, "Holy crap, that was amazing!" And it's now one of my favoriteest movies of all time, that I will just periodically pull up on a streaming service or put in the DVD because that, that's the thing I still do, and just watch it, and I love it. And really, the only thing that's consistent across the two is there's a character named Danny Ocean, there's a big crew of people, and they're robbing multiple casinos at once. Yeah. Oh yeah, and then there's the the mummy. There's the original mummy movie, uh, by Universal with uh, was that Boris Karloff? I want to say. Yeah, probably back in the day. And then there was the the one that we all remember from uh, uh, like high school and college with uh, uh, Brendan Fraser, which was actually a remake of that. And now there was this new one, the Tom uh, Tom Cruise featuring the mummy, which was not good but apparently that one you. was not good for just a variety of reasons <laughs> but let's jump to video games real quick okay a lot of big video game franchises once they go on long enough they decide they need to reboot uh the, yeah. the first one on my list is doom uh -huh. part of that is because i'm currently playing through the all the doom games i'm still on one whatever but uh the Doom in 2016 was like, all right, Doom 1 and 2 were like this. Doom 3 was this other thing that wasn't Doom at all, but we were we tried something new. Let's go back and do a modern version of what Doom was. And the modern version of Doom is crazy, fast-paced, you're constantly moving, you're constantly uh, shooting uh, demons with various guns, depending on where what you have ammo for. And... It's uh, it's what. Okay, it's what do the original Doom was in our heads. <laughs> That's fair. Like, yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, That's, it actually makes a lot of. When sense. I said I'd come back to the Masters of the Universe uh, reboot, that's what I meant. The original Masters of the Universe. I was a He-Man kid, right? I loved it, and in my memory. Masters Universe was way better than it really is. Mm -hmm. But the the early 2000s <clears throat> reboot took the He-Man cartoon that lived in my brain and made it real. Like, He-Man actually does cool stuff. And the villains actually do cool stuff instead of throwing rocks at He-Man. And he catches it. And then throws it over there. And, and then goes... Galator! Yeah, and then goes... Meh, and grabs him... And pulls them off by the, the, the their collar. You know, like, the original cartoon was so bad and stupid and, and, and not good. But in my head, it's way better. And the new version took what lives in my head and put it on the screen. So I loved it. It was so awesome. And that's what the new Doom does. It takes what... Because Doom was... It wasn't the first first-person shooter... But it was the first super popular one. Like, it was so popular that the genre name was Doom Clone for years. 
Yeah. <laughs> and it took our unformed, unused to playing this type of game, and it was frantic and fast-paced, and you ran around a lot, and you were switching weapons constantly, and it was very, uh, and playing it now, it it's not the way it lives in our in our heads. It's still fast-paced and frantic, but compared to the new one, n- no. It's <laughs> <laughs> still fast-paced and frantic until you get lost in a corner of the level you already cleared out. <laughs> Man, thank yeah. God it had a functional map, or I would never have gotten through... Uh, I think it was chapter three. I spent a lot of time in the map going, okay, hang on. But, uh, yeah, the new Doom takes what we remember and makes it real instead of what we, what really happened. And this is the thing that came up in the Discord with WoW Classic. Like, people remember World of Warcraft back in the day as something way better than it really was. So when WoW Classic came out, there was so much hype and the servers couldn't handle the load and now nobody talks about it. Because they gave you what WoW Classic actually was and you get in there and you play for a while and you're like, wow, this sucks. New WoW is much better and you go back. <laughs> Which is the goal. <laughs> yeah. Never meet your heroes, kids. Even if you think you met them when you were a kid. So sometimes, yeah, like, that can work both ways. You know, WoW Classic didn't jazz anything up, and a bunch of people were like, oh, right. And then they stopped playing it. But then New Doom did the opposite of that. Uh, and sometimes they want to reboot things for, like, a story reason. So I go to Mortal Kombat 9, which was just called Mortal Kombat. Nowadays we call it 9, because just calling it Mortal Kombat was freaking stupid. But it was a reboot. It, it actually, in story, erased everything that happened <laughs> ever in Mortal Kombat uh, lore and just started over. Because it got really weird and confusing and bizarre. And they were like, Even you know what? Even Defenders of the Realm? <laughs> Even the live action TV show and the cartoon? Especially those. <laughs> <laughs> I guess every now and then, any franchise that goes on long enough needs a crisis on Infinite Earths. Yeah, at some point, <laughs> pretty much clean up. I think another reason that you see reboots uh, in video games is from one for one very practical reason. Uh, same reason you kind of see with some technology with movies is you know you get new technology, IMAX. Uh, color, you know, uh, 3D, etc. But this problem, or perhaps opportunity, is amplified in video games because I have on my list just as examples: Metroid, Su- Super Metroid, and Metroid Prime, because both of those were games uh, in a longer series that really not only do they. Um, present new elements to the series but they really use the hardware on the new system or newer system that they're introduced neither of those i think was a launch title for those systems but still they they were the first ones in that series on that system and so going from metroid and metroid 2 on the game boy to super metroid you saw huge advancements in terms of like graphics things like that and then needless to say when you go to prime on uh was that the gamecube yeah and the 3d reimagining that i know some people maybe didn't like it as much but it felt very natural for me and it's like oh this is what it's like to be in the power suit walking around um really captured that pretty well so those were on my like successes list was prime a, a reboot or was it just a, no, the it's, next... it's all no. continuity. Okay. Yeah, it's part so of it, was, it was literally just a sequel. Those but were it was, but it was a, a very, but it was in a very, very different format. Yeah, right. I've got some yeah. on my list here that are I named mechanical reboots, and that's what Prime is. Uh, a a a actual um, reboot reboot would have been Super Castlevania because technically, even though Super Castlevania was Castlevania Four. It's Castlevania, the original one, but that the story with Simon and all that, they literally said, yeah, this is Castlevania. It's just on the Super Nintendo. And anyone that wants to disagree with me about the quality 
of Super Castlevania can make me out back because it's just better than the original in almost every conceivable way. Like, just because you have new technology does not mean that it's a better game, but it's true here. From the yeah. soundtrack to the graphics to the gameplay. Oh my god, I can whip in different directions. How amazing. Uh, and then on the failure side, um, hmm, Castlevania 3D or Castlevania 64. Oh, yeah, I, so, I, mean, I rented it once. And I was like, what? I've rented it a couple times trying to uh, you know, get through it. So that's an example of New platform, new technology. That, didn't work. They they'll even tell you it didn't it didn't work. Yeah. So just that's that's another of those like mechanical reboots. Like I've got Grand Theft Auto because from Grand Theft Auto two to Grand Theft Auto three is a completely <laughs> different thing. From Fallout two to Fallout three is a completely different thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, I I don't know if those count in the way that we're we're discussing here but still i I thought they were close enough so i would consider uh the resident evil series to be sort of in that same vein too because if you do (laughs) resident evil 2 and resident evil 3 they were that fixed angle you you have that pre um uh (laughs) pre-camera this is what it looks like on this set and then when you get to resident evil 4 where you have that over the shoulder angle that was a huge yeah. difference. Yeah, well, and even yeah. when they remade the games, well, they did say, the over the show over the shoulder angles as opposed to the fixed camera. Well, I was gonna say, hasn't Resident Evil Two even? I mean, a lot of the games in the series have had, you know, been ported to different platforms, but Resident Evil Two remake actually followed the success of Resident Evil Seven like a year or two ago. I haven't played them. So it was a little, little more than that, but like, so resident evil is a good series for this because the resident evil, the first resident evil got a a remake that was essentially a a remaster because it's updated graphics, but they also changed some things, added some quality of life. It's the same game, but better. Right. Yes. And then with the RE2 and RE3 make, uh, it's the same story for the most part. I haven't actually played them. I actually never played any of the Resident Evil games except for four and five. So I'm not sure how much of the story changes in between Resident Evil 2 and the remake and Resident Evil 3 and the remake. But it's instead of the same game, but better, now it's the same story, the same idea, but told in a drastically different way because like, uh, they said you've got the over the shoulder camera and all new mechanics and it's a fundamentally different experience exactly and um, people loved the resident evil 2 remake just just loved it and then the resident evil 3 remake happened and it wasn't as universally loved like i'm not sure why chat says it's because some stuff was stripped out I, I didn't know that, having never like, played the original. But uh, I, I think between that and the fact that, all right, we already did this with two, we get it. <laughs> and three, was, I thought, so, I remember correctly, was also just way shorter. And so not like game, in a tighter way, but shorter in like a crap is missing way. So like the, the yeah. fundamental difference is like just comparing only the original versions of these games. Um, Resident Evil, the original one, and it's, you know, more immediate remake. And then 2 and 0 were all, and I guess Code Veronica, were all scary games where you're running around like you're in a horror movie. Like the Mm -hmm. camera is locked in place, you're running from stuff, you're going to go around a corner and be completely surprised by what's there. You're confused to where you are on the screen with your tank controls. It was a whole thing. Resident Evil 3 was the the shift towards a more action game because you're just being chased the whole time. Like, you're not trying to solve a bunch of puzzles. You're just trying to find the MacGuffin to get you through the next door to get away from the monster until you get to the end of the game. And so I think when it comes to Hmm. shifting the entire mechanics to a more modern, like, you know, over-the-shoulder game, well, now you're in exploration mode in a game that was meant for exploring. Two has a lot to play with. 
three is still a run from the big monster game and shifting it to something that's more suited for that probably just took away what made it as interesting for some people. I can see that. Like, yeah, this is me saying that was... having only seen the videos, I have not played the new games. Yeah. Two was was a was a radical game because not only was it you know, you have sort of a you're you're moving through a story and everything and you're trying to find out what happens, but you also had that there were two characters and if you played one version that you got one one thing happened, but if you played the other character then and other things happen and so it was it was a really neat mechanic that wasn't really res, uh copied in any other game yeah like to get the there most a, out of resident evil 2 version of it yeah to get the most out of resident evil 2 you had to play it four times mm-hmm. like you had to do uh who are the two characters claire leon. and uh, uh leon face leon. yeah leon. who's who's, face. Yeah, who's the face. who's the woman Claire, Claire, Claire Redfield. Redfield. Oh, Claire was in two. I thought Claire was in yeah. one. No, Jill was in one. Sorry, Jill was in one. Yeah, so you you had to play Claire, and then Leon, and you'd get X ending, and then you'd have to play Leon and then Claire to get the other like side of the story, and it was really bizarre. Oh, apparently, that's a thing that was that's different in the remake, if I remember correctly. I could be wrong on this. Is that it? Doesn't matter. I don't. I don't think it matters uh, what order you play them in as far as the story goes, but I could be wrong on that. Yeah. The, this is, I think a lot of us talking about a thing that we haven't played at this point. True. true. Um, but yeah, like the, the point is when you shift the nature of the gameplay experience, even if the story is the same, the game is very different. Yes. Uh, but for yeah. the purposes of a successful remake, it's a different game. Cool. You're playing something different. And so if it's good, then you like it and it's a good remake if they change a lot of things and it's bad, well, it's still bad. As long as you don't alienate too much of the people that played it originally, you know, not terribly many Sonic fans necessarily were into Sonic Spinball. Like, if you didn't like Pinball, probably weren't going to play it. So, All right, this has gone on long enough. How have three of you played the Final Fantasy VII remake and not no one has mentioned it yet? Uh, because we're trying not to... to make that the whole show it would take over the show <laughs> i i would literally so, sit here and talk about ff7 remake until sunday exactly. chapter one verse one <laughs> brian begins are you sure you want to do this i was not going to do that to you because that will re- will be the rest of the show you know that right all right well fair enough but that's another example of a, a remake that's both a story overhaul and a mechanical overhaul. Like, would either none of you would have played the Final Fantasy VII remake if it hadn't been the Final Fantasy VII remake? If it was just the exact same game, gameplay wise, but with a new IP, none of you would have. I mean, uh, like not a Final Fantasy IP specifically. Yeah, with, with some other IP that wasn't Final Fantasy VII. No, none of you would have played it not once, right? Yeah, sure. um, um, exactly. I, I I think so, just because the list of video games I play right now is so incredibly short, especially for console. I probably would not have gotten. I think, proven to your point, as we get older and we have less time, we're gonna go to things that we have an idea of what we're getting. Make me uh, comfortable. Like I will play. FF7 remake. I was originally not going to. Like, if you listen to the odds and ends from a year ago, I was really down on it before it came out. He was. I played the demo and I didn't care for it. I thought it was like a pretty weak cash grab. I was not all that hyped about it. But it's a pandemic. I decided, well, I've got time to kill and I kind of want to get caught up in an internet distraction right now. I I played it. It completely blew me away. Like, it's, in my opinion, it's the best video game I've played in like five years. I, um, I kind of agree. It, it was insanely good. And mm-hmm. for a whole bunch of reasons, I can't tell anyone who hasn't played it. Um, and I can't normally say that about a remake. Yeah. Like the experience is actually playing it and leaving yourself open to be surprised by things that don't go the way you expect them to, because yeah. you've got a much bigger world. There's a lot more to explore. And they have the benefit of having like, it's very clear that people who worked on this game, 
have had more than 20 years to think about what they would do. Yeah. And anybody that says, oh, well, it's just the first part of the game, and they use the word padding for all the stuff that was added in, I would disagree because the, this is not a game about trying to get from point A to the end of the game as quickly as possible. The point, and oh, well, why are you making me do all this extra stuff? The point is to get you invested in the setting that you're in so that when certain things happen they actually matter because you've been playing for more than an hour so yeah that's and it's fun to do them like padding and grinding i don't like grinding but i never felt like well gee i, I have to do all these side like quests before i do the next thing yeah like grinding, grinding is work. we are playing we are going yes. we are exploring we are doing stuff we are meeting people we're filling in story gaps there's a lot of stuff out there that's really fun and exciting and like for me one of the strongest things that that remake did do is it didn't just capture playing final fantasy 7 it captured yeah. being a fan of final fantasy 7 in the late 1990s when the internet lost its mind it felt like I was playing through every fanfic that some excited person wrote, every bit of fan art, every bit of like complete expanding on this very limited bit of the world. And it delivered it. And mm -hmm. I can't think of another video game that I've played that has been able to do that. I, I fully, fully agree. And I think whenever I did an odds and ends and everything, I, my thought was exactly that, that you... There are characters that in the original series you were like, okay, this character's here. Okay, they were an interesting character, but <clears throat> you only got to see them for like an hour. And then they were gone. Now, having played the remake, you're, you become emotionally invested in them. And having played the original, you're going, okay, you've given me hours and hours of these characters. And now I'm I'm kind of emotionally invested in them. But now I know something's going to happen to them. Or will it? Because they changed and, and the, Yeah, and that, well, like... that was the thing is I hadn't gone to the end of the game and I'm going, dang it, Square, you have screwed me because now I'm going, I don't want this person to go through this fate because I like this person. You have given me three hours of, of this character's kind of cool. And they're 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 relatable. They're not the the I guess the, the original series you're going, yeah, they're just sort of there to blow stuff up and sort of be like a yeah, I'm not doing this on my own. I have a team that's helping me. And now you you've given me this okay, you got me the, you got these characters and I, I want them to be around you. I you have put me emotionally invested in them. Please don't do something to them. Like you're gonna, like I know what's gonna happen because you, you're gonna break my heart. You're, I'm gonna sit for like an hour and I'm gonna cry because you know X character is dead now. And they after knew I've it. you know become emotionally attached to them. Like the significant thing is that they knew that a large portion of the people playing this game either played the original or knows what happened because it was that big of a thing. They did so not. Right, worry about we're, it. we're getting into blatantly obvious spoiler territory so mm -hmm. let's just stop talking about what happens to jesse and move crap <laughs> well that actually wasn't what i was going to go into though um there's a lot of stuff that happened outside of the original game because they kept adding to final fantasy 7 over the years they had actual books they had movies they had four other video games that came out and most people didn't play those things. Most people didn't read them. Like most people just played seven and moved on. And they knew that these were things that were there that, like I said before, they could pull into. I finished seven and I finally got off my butt and played Crisis Core. I ignored Crisis Core forever. I didn't have a PSP. I didn't care. They pulled me enough back into the world that I went and I found a 15 year old game and I played it. Whoa. And a lot of that is just building up on the idea that they can hint at more stuff being out there without actually having to show it to you. And they can know that you have certain ideas going in and they can set things up to 
surprise you, not surprise you, deliver on it, make you worry about it. They can create anxiety that some players will have while others will just be like, this is fun and still have a good game experience. Yeah. It's not dependent on you knowing the source material. Yeah. That's, I think that's another key element. So let's, now that we've been going for like two hours, let's see if we can't like come up with some conclusions here. Like what, Taking everything into account that we've said, what makes a, a remake or a reboot or a remaster or a legacy sequel worth consuming? Like, I think one is that it has to just not be crap. Yeah. Like Tron Legacy and uh, what was the other one that was that we mentioned that was it was just not good. I mean, we've talked about RoboCop a, tuple, a couple times. Oh, Total Recall is another one. Like, it just... It's just not a good movie. And if something... Oh, oh, uh, Crystal Skull. Like, if something isn't a good movie... Now, it's not that Crystal Skull was bad, but it wasn't good. It's like it had a story that was just kind of... Indy fights this... And he doesn't get what he want, what he's looking for in the end, sort of thing. Like when you decide you're gonna play the nostalgia card, you are getting a lot of free attention. Yep. But you have to actually deliver on it, or you're gonna get a lot of out of proportion backlash. When we say if this wasn't a sequel to a thing that you knew, would you have still liked it? You lose the ability to play that. Once you've convinced me that, oh, this isn't just any, you know, fun comedy movie. This is Ghostbusters. My expectations for Ghostbusters should be pretty low because, like, realistically, I've seen good Ghostbusters and I've seen bad Ghostbusters and way before 2016. So, like, if you're going to dig out a franchise after a long time and you're going to try to build up some hype on it, you have to deliver better than average. Yeah. And ignoring the idiot entitled white boy outrage at uh the 2016 ghostbusters movie which i did ignore entirely i i finally watched the movie and it's fine it's okay yeah like it's not great it's nowhere near as funny as the original uh but i enjoyed it but i don't it doesn't it doesn't surplant the position of the the original yeah it was it was it was fine like the fact that it had uh uh at the very least cameos from the the four original ghostbusters made me happy like the actors uh that made me happy harold ramus's head appeared somewhere didn't it wasn't he he, didn't uh, have... he was the statue that was in front of the school that's what i thought yeah okay but like it was it was fine, but it didn't, like Bill said, it didn't do anything with the nostalgia other than the name and the fact that there were ghosts. It leaned too heavily on the idea that you understood and saw the original movie, and it spent a lot of the movie reminding you that you could be watching the original movie. Now, I liked it. I liked it as a movie. I had a great time watching it. I really wanted them to get more movies now that they'd already gotten that out of their system because I love the chemistry in the cast. I loved what they were doing. Yeah. But they just devoted too much to the movie to reminding you that the original Ghostbusters movie was there and making constant references to things from it. Like, see, get it? We remember. It's like, just make a movie. <laughs> just make a good new movie that and happens it, to be people hunting down ghosts. And there, there's a, it's nice to occasionally just have like that one moment where you have that Easter egg of... Hey, remember this? Yeah, we're we're making a reference to it, but then you just sort of continue on with your own story. Yeah, yeah. that is a good. I point. think there's there a were... difference between that and and so on. There were way too many like uh, of those moments in that movie, like lines lifted from the original and jokes lifted from the original, and they just kept instead of having like the one uh moment, it was just a barrage of uh moments. Like they they leaned too hard into this nostalgia instead of doing their own thing. instead of uh, the, you know using the nostalgia as a tool to tell their own tale. If you if if all you do is show bits and pieces of the original, you're just gonna make people want to go and watch the original. 
So yeah. you're not, yeah. So uh, I have to head out. I apologize. Um, I agree with what's been said so far. I I just have to take care. Yeah, I have to take care of the the dogs and see something quick. So, gentlemen, have a great night. This was a very interesting discussion. And I guess for my very quick final thought, I did do a pre-release with Sam. Um, and you know what? Maybe I'll talk about that more next episode when, you know, if we talk about actual, like, Magic the Gathering. So, yeah. And uh, everybody have a good night. And don't go see the new Mummy movie. Trust me. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Come on. It is cursed. So, uh, so kind of go with is that, again, going back to Final Fantasy Remake... Final Fantasy VII Remake. Let me clarify. There were tons of callbacks, but they retold it in a in a way that made it more interesting. And and I think with remakes that like it sort of maybe uh, contrast this a little bit. So I am really looking forward to the the Mass Effect um, Legends part uh, a product that's coming out here in may the reason why i like that is because it's not a re it's not a remake or anything it's just a they're taking everything i want they're putting it into a uniform product and they're compacting it all into one thing that i really want that's very different than final fantasy 7 where it's we're retelling, we're remaking the story. It's still the same story. It still has the same beats and everything, but we're we're delving deeper and giving you more content. And because we're going so deep, we want to uh, clarify and unify the story. Because there's comic books. Uh, uh, I know um, uh, Chifuji had mentioned Crisis Core in this, and we've mentioned additional products in this, but the problem is those are totally different products. But with a with the remake, you can unify that story into one narrative, with the ability to re um, reorganize the story so that it makes a better sense, or even just says, okay, we did this. It's really cool. We're going to take it in a different direction. We're still going to get there in the end, but we're going to go a different route. That also means more interesting gameplay, more interesting story, more interesting effects. And that's, I, I'm kind of looking for it. And that, that gets me hyped. Um, another, and again, I'm going to, I'm going to go back to a nostalgia example for me personally is the Battlestar series. I have seen like I had uh, heard all this awesome stuff about the original Battlestar Galactica series, and then I watched. I think like there was a, a day that either TNT or some one of those networks played a whole bunch of them, and I watched like three episodes and thought, okay, you guys have a narrative, but you you kind of were like, yes, the Battlestars all got destroyed except for this one, and you have these exp uh, uh, special effects where it's like. Psh, 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 they were models all right battle star is yeah. the only one that got away whereas the new series said this is why the battle star got away this is why the fleet is and it went so much deeper into it and i think with if you're gonna retell a story even if it's a remake or a retelling it's you're more than welcome to take the original material but take me somewhere else with it or give me more context with the series that still gets me to all the the major points which again i know with um the marvel series or uh, sorry the uh, the ultimate um x-men series they were gonna uh, was it was it in episode or the uh the the novella two the volume two one where they were like we're gonna talk about the the phoenix and everything but the Phoenix only showed up for like like two issues. And it was like, we're going to call the Phoenix. And then the X-Men show up and like, no, you're not. And then like she did just, that was it. Okay, you, you, you were taking me in that direction. And then you just kind of like 
slapped me in the face and said, no, we're not. We might bring it back later sort of thing. They reminded you that you should never, ever get your hopes up when they decide they're going to do a story about the Phoenix. It, and that's the thing is that if you're going to do that, if you're going to bring back something that, and again, and again old, not, old comic book stories are ones where, and I, and I, I really think Marvel, the MCU has done a really good job of this so far is here are these interesting characters some characters we want to keep around for a little while because we can do stuff with them. And then there's some characters where we need a bad guy, we need them to do something, and then we're fine killing them off. Loki is a character where he feels like that we can play him and have him do stuff and make things more interesting as we go, whereas Helia, she shows up and really is does she have any more character development if the answer is no absolutely make her a one-off in a movie and make her the bad guy that you're just like i really hope something bad happens to her and then kill her off but and and that's sort of the thing with the comic book series is i i'm aware that um the, like the phoenix saga and everything was there and that was a big deal and everything but if you're gonna do a retelling and you're going to say, we're going to drop hints at this and, you know, make me invested in that if you're going to run in that direction. But don't just say, oh, we're going to do the Phoenix. Oh, never mind. We're not going to do it because we may come back to it later. Don't do that. Build up to it and then make it something. How, how did we get on comic books? <laughs> well, it's, I'm talking about like I'm looking over at the side at comic books and I was trying to. Like, it's one of those things where if you're going to do a remake and a retelling and everything, if you're going to pick a penultimate event, and the Phoenix Saga is it was would be a penultimate event in the the X Men series, I'm just from the cartoon series. It was a big deal in the cartoon. Like they dedicated what, like five episodes to it. Yeah. And then they did the Dark Phoenix. And that was if like. If you're going to make bunch. something a big deal and you're going to use it to hype people up, you actually have to deliver. Yeah. I think and, what Dirk they, is getting like, at. Well, that was the thing is in the, the cartoon, the X Men cartoon series, like the, the 90s version, that was a big deal. Like they, they pushed it. Because they, I remember them doing the, the one where, you know, like you have the, the, the normal cartoon sort of animation and then you have the one where it's like okay this needs to be a big deal so we're gonna pay high dollar to have good animation in this and the one where they were sort of hinting at the phoenix saga they paid high dollar for animation for that and compared to the original uh run and that was a big deal because, again, you looked and were like, okay, the animation's a little bit different. It's a little bit more, like, detailed. It's a little more, the flow is you're, a little bit different. You're getting bogged down in details here, buddy. I know. But, again, that's the, <laughs> the thing is that when you're doing, a, like, a remake and a retelling and all that is you can't just be, we're going to do, we're going to hint at this and just, and just not do it. So, for instance, just to try to, tie off this whole comic book thing had they shown okay i almost died at the end of was it avengers it was when thanos showed his face for the first time when he turned yeah. and grinned at the camera i almost i sat there staring at the screen with my jaw hanging open for a good minute straight and mom kept poking me are you all right and i couldn't speak because thanos for years has been my favorite villain in comics, like the infinity gauntlet series. Uh, and then his role in the infinity war series, like Thanos is just my boy. Right. And when I saw him on the screen, I knew that meant we were getting a, a gauntlet and something like that at some point in the future. Yeah. They'd been training us to use the after credit thing as a teaser of what's coming. So when you saw it on the screen, there's a good chance it's actually going to happen. 
Right. And because there's no other story you could do with Thanos that yeah. has any resonance with anybody. And so I just, I was shook. But what Dirk is saying is if they had shown that and then Thanos had just been like a one-off villain in some movie, we all would have been horribly disappointed. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And with a remake, you've got to like, if if I... If I think what I'm getting from Dirk's long, extremely way too detail oriented rant is if you're trying to, you have to do something that's worth it. Like you can't just, all right, we're going to redo Footloose, but with new music. Roll credits. What? Mm-hmm. <laughs> like if the, uh, Yeah, if if the new Thunder or the newer or the the Cartoon Network Thundercats cartoon had been started off with the multi-part intro and then from then on just went back to being goofy Rankin Bass style shenanigans, it would have been like uh you started off so strong and then you went Yeah. And there's so many new reboots that they, they kind of start out that way and then they just kind of go to pot. But there's also a lot that have done a really good job. Again, the the 2005, uh, 2007 Battlestar Galactica, they did a fantastic job. I actually think the new Voltron on Netflix did a fantastic job. Yeah, like... The only reason I haven't talked about it more is because I'm on, like, episode four, I think, of season two. So I'm still at the beginning. The first season, though, was the hotness. Like, the characters... Absolutely. The characters all have per individual personalities. Other than, like, each one was a one-trick, uh, like, a one-note character in the original cartoon. And I loved that original movie, which was, like, five or six episodes strung together of the original cartoon. Mm-hmm. But looking back on it, the characters all were one note. You know, Hunk was fat. Pidge was short. I eat the food. <laughs> I'm the girl. Good talk. Uh, well, there wasn't a girl in the original. No, it's just I like that was no. typically what the, the characters princess. of the time period were. Like, like Sven had a funny accent. That was his whole thing. Like, <laughs> and he eventually got killed off. So damn. <laughs> but the the new cartoon actually fleshes them all out. And rather than just, all right, now we have the lions. Now we're Voltron. Now we kick ass. They're like learning and growing as characters. Mm-hmm. And like I, said, I can't speak to what happens later because I haven't watched it yet. But if the quality maintains, which apparently it does for at least a couple more uh, seasons, then it, it's going to be worth totally worth watching. I sort of got distracted with uh, Cobra Kai, so I haven't gone back to... <laughs> I haven't gone well, back to Voltron yet. And and another one sort of is the the uh, new DuckTales redo. That the if you watch the original DuckTales, the the three nephews, Huey, Dewey, and Louie, they were essentially the exact same character. They were interchangeable and in, in at least exactly. The US you could, yeah. all you had to do is be like, all right, we're gonna do a Huey episode, and everyone goes. Uh, so is that the red one or is that the green one? Yeah. yeah. And so. The new one says, no, each one has their own personality. And that was... The Hobbit movies are not a a complete faithful retelling of The Hobbit. But no. I do give, I will give Peter Jackson props that the dwarves are unique. Yeah, they that, do that, that, have personality, individual personalities that I do like. At least in like, the first was, movie. Yeah, at, at least in the. I f- mean, the first one. When you're talking good things about the Hobbit movies, you're talking about the first one. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, you're right because like it was a running joke that there were too many dwarves to keep up with. That's why Gandalf is counting instead of paying attention to who they are when they're running by. Like mm-hmm. that's the joke. But the movie took advantage of its runtime, which is way too long. But it took that time to actually flesh them out a bit, give them all unique characters and personality quirks, and a little bit of time to see them all. And that's one of the benefits of adaptation. 
Yeah, but again, that's sort of a different episode. But yeah, <laughs> and we didn't even mention Animaniacs, which does Animaniacs. I think is a is a rare exception to this rule because it does exactly the same thing that original Animaniacs did from the two episodes I've watched anyway. Yep. <laughs> it just does it so perfectly well and set in the here and now instead of, you know, back in the 90s that it doesn't matter? Yeah, I think um Animaniacs was just ahead of its time in the 90s and the rest of time caught up to it so it can continue doing what it did and it just fits in. <laughs> like it's just good. Like it's so meta. It's so aware of itself and what it's doing. And it's not afraid to tell you what it's doing because it knows it's still funny. And like the words the Hulu of... spelled out in giant stacks of cash in the yeah. intro. That yeah. made me happy beyond all reason. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, all the way through. Like, they're completely aware of what they're doing. Um, and they were in the 90s. But that kind of writing and that kind of like intelligence just assuming your audience isn't stupid goes infinitely far and it's still good now just like it was then only now they know that at least some of their audience are adults because like they were always aiming for the kids and the parents yeah and now that's much easier to do because the parents were the kids so they can play both ends of it and it's great yeah if you've got hulu and you haven't seen it just go watch it it's wonderful it's great experience yeah like i've only watched the first two episodes but i was sold i'm like this is really good yes so we need to so it needs to be quality mike are you okay you've been really quiet um yeah i'm fine okay just feel free to jump in at any point if you if you had anything to say which i'm sure if you did you would so just wanted to make sure you hadn't dozed off or actually hadn't stabbed you in the neck no, yeah, neither of those things happened. <laughs> He's like, she stabbed me in the thigh, stupid. <laughs> that very slight delay was for the knife to move from the neck. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so we need your your remake or reboot or sequel or whatever to be quality. Like, it has to be good. It, it needs to reference the original but not depend on the original. I think it needs to build on it. It needs to make yeah. the original yes. better. That was going to be yes. my next point. It needs to do something different. If not different, it, uh, at least more or like you need to stay true to the original source in, uh, in some way, like to maybe not tone because apparently the new lost in space, uh, I was just told in the School of Movies Discord, it just popped up a minute ago, is really good. And that's drastically different in tone from the original. <laughs> yeah. But it well, needs to I stay think... true to it in in some, like, fundamental, like, essential, like, essence. Uh, stay true to the essence of the original while doing something new and different that makes it more better. -er. You've got to rationalize yeah, why something. we're thinking about the original while we're watching this. Right. Yeah, in that vein, there was something that there was a comment I wanted to make earlier when Brian brought up um, Metroid Prime, Metroid Prime Fusion, the games on the GameCube. That switch to the first person format was so, so different, but you also still kept the tone of, you know, uh, loneliness being stranded in the same place on a completely alien world that odd that feeling of loneliness was a big part of metroid and yeah prime captured it really well that tone carried over i think prime had the ability to like they made a conscious choice in prime that they did not make in um like other, other m or whatever m. the one yeah which was we have the ability to make characters talk we're choosing not to like we could have samus talking we could have samus narrating log recordings or whatever but the only times you really get anything out of samus are if she makes a noise because she falls or when lightning flashes and you can very very briefly see her reflection on the inside of the visor and they're like that's enough 
That's all you need. That's how we continue holding that feeling from the original games of this is someone running through an environment. The focus is on the world around Samus and reminding you how Samus is alone by herself in this one place. And that's something that you can use with newer technology that you couldn't do in the old ones. And they understood that value and they doubled down on it. And I think Mike is entirely right. Yes. But you also need to not go too far and try to over-explain crap that doesn't need over-explaining. See also Prometheus. Cube. Cube? The movies. Oh, I only ever saw, I think, the first two. Yeah, like the... The first Cube movie has a million mysteries, and then they made Cube Zero to try to answer all of them, and it just was a bad idea. Oh. Don't, like, don't like, take away the thinking if that's what people like about it. Like, Alien was a horror movie. Aliens was an action movie. Alien 3 was some other thing. Alien 4 was a cash-in. Or what was it for? Al Resurrection? Resurrection, yeah. And then the franchise died because 3 and 4 were just not it. And then someone decided to have the brilliant idea to make Prometheus. I think Alien vs. Predator happened first. Yeah, it did. Just to drum up interest again. But then someone had this brilliant idea to make Prometheus and, like, try to explain things. And midichlorians. Like, you don't need... We don't need this super deep explanation of things that don't Your matter. audience has accepted space magic. Why are you trying to take that apart? Yeah, like, I, I enjoyed the the movie solo but we really didn't need to know that the four things that we know about han solo's past all happened within the span of two weeks like we just didn't I mean, need to know that admittedly as, is he, uh, he's, as he's as like a high school football player he, he yeah. peaked when he was young and he was just coasting ever since like the, the idea that after one bad thing happens, every existing Star Wars character has to go and just suck for 50 years until the next generation shows up is an unfortunate recurring theme in right? the movies. It's like, oh, you, you did your one thing. Cool. You were you were that RPG character who got from level 1 to 20 in a year, but there is no level 21 for you. This is you, and now you're an old wizard. But... Like, that's, that's a major problem with, with some of these yeah. things, is they try to, okay, let's fill in all the gaps so that everything is crystallized. And no, you don't need that. Aliens lay eggs, and then the thing pops out, and, it, and it, it impregnates you, and then it bursts out of your chest, and then it eats the crew. That's what we needed to know. <laughs> that's all that you needed to know, period. Like, the, it tells you everything about it. It tells you its motivation. It tells you why you're afraid of it. As a monster, that's all that matters. <laughs> Yeah, I don't need to know that aliens, when they're dreaming, first of all, that they dream, and second, that they dream of ice cream. That doesn't matter unless I'm using ice cream to kill them. Like, it's irrelevant. Like, that's especially a thing in horror movies, it seems. Like, the Rob Zombie uh, Halloween movies went into extremely deep uh, backstory on Michael Myers, and it's unnecessary. You got all the backstory of Michael Myers you needed in that original film when he when you looking through his eyes and he kills someone and then they rip the mask off and he's a little kid and you're like, what? Like you don't need more than that. <laughs> it's a little mystery is good sometimes, but then in other ways, I guess that that mainly applies to things where mystery is important. Well, because... I don't need to feel like the movie is checking boxes. That's another point. And I, I think that's want, what you're, you're saying there. <laughs> yeah, you don't want it to be just a box-checking exercise, which is one of the, the my problems with Solo, is that it was literally just box-checking. Like, yep, okay, we got this. Remember that time he said this? Psh, we got that. Hey, Lando? Psh, got that. All right, what else? Chewie? Psh, got that. What else? <laughs> and that bothered me. As, uh, I, guess, I guess, a legacy prequel thing. Like, Rogue One did the same thing, but in a completely different... Like, it took a tiny little fraction of Star Wars lore and told that story, which is why the name was Star Wars... Uh, uh, Rogue One, A Star Wars Story. Like, that was awesome. Because it took... There was this whole adventure around this little thing, like... 
hey, we got these plans. Because in the original, that's all it was. But it was fine. It worked. Rogue One is better than anyone gives it uh, credit, or most people give it credit for. Even though I still don't know any of the characters' names, except for like two of them. Yeah. Like, it's it's Jen Erso and uh, freaking uh, Andor. Caspian Andor? Maybe. Yeah. And like everyone else in that movie is just, you know, the guy with the big gun or the not Jedi blind guy that was Donnie Yen. Yeah. <laughs> I have no idea what their names are and I don't care. It doesn't matter. <laughs> That's a problem. It feels that like I don't it's know a cast names. of rogue like characters. Like we just ran some archetypes. We got there. We did it. <laughs> snarky robot. Let's go. Yeah. I have no idea what the snarky robots number is and I don't care. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. But, uh, but it still uh, needs I need to, to do feel like, something. Like, if your movie is just filling in the gaps for something else, all you're really telling me is that the original one didn't fill those in or it decided they weren't important enough to fill in. And that doesn't bode well for your movie. Yeah. If you're expanding on it, if you're doing something bigger with it, if you're making me interested in another part of the world, okay, we can do that. That's fine. Um, I want to feel like the world is bigger than it was when I first saw it. And I want to feel like what I'm seeing fits in. But again, like you you wander pretty hard into like what you expect out of sequels and things like that rather than just remakes um, or, you know, stuff on those levels. Like if you do a bunch of time to the forward, then I want to see what the world looks like a few years later. Like I want to watch Legend of Korra to see the rest of the world. And if you spend the entire first season in this city that wasn't there before, I'm not getting that yet. Um, yeah. That's a thing. But I, I think we're starting to hit on really big storytelling notes that go a bit outside of remakes at this point. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, make a good thing and give it a reason to be associated with the original thing so that we don't think you're just doing name recognition to sell us something. Like, make us feel like it's worth it. Yep. And do do something new with it. Like, I'm surprised that we haven't brought up Doctor Who yet because the Doctor Who revival was like I was, huge i was thinking about it earlier but that was back when we were talking about the person who makes it having passion for it because each of the showrunners for doctor who due to the nature of that show grew up watching doctor who and when they came in they had decades of wondering what they would do if they were in charge so when they finally were in charge they had a bunch of stories ready to go and so the first season or two of each showrunner have been amazing and then things drop off once they're like i've been thinking about this for three decades stories run out and they actually have to tell other stories um and then it becomes a lot more hit or miss but hmm. you know to do doctor who you have to be like what do people like about him what do i like about him and you've got the luxury of a story that lets you continue everything on in one massive continuity that can have throwbacks but you also get a soft reboot because you get to recast and recharacterize the main character and all of the supporting characters every time so it's kind of like the weird meta example of everything that we're talking about huh neat having i unfortunately have got to head out so but it's become late <laughs> yeah we're we're gonna be wrapping up any minute now i'm sure so well i i will say that like we've been talking about, there are good remakes and reboots, and then there are bad ones. And it's a combination of what was it about the original that made it unique? What can you do to make it better? And <clears throat> what what can be done that improves on the original's formula to keep it unique and to keep what made it so special going as a series and that's a good one and and we'll see like with the final fantasy 7 part 2 remake part 2 that will we've we you've had this such a big build up with the first one will the second one live up to what has sort of been built up will it will it the the impression i've gotten is that we're we're sort of uh it's a we're gonna probably live go in the 
in the same general direction as the original, but we're not going to hold ourselves to these are the beats we have to follow. That we can, instead of going from A to B, we can hit C, D, E, F, G along the way to B. And that's sort of the thing to see what they do. And with new shows that are coming out, will they keep the original and add more content, flesh out characters? What will they do to make it, keep it in the original vein, but also improve on it and, and take us in a direction that improves on the original formula? Hmm. And with that thought, I am unfortunately going to have to head out. So everyone, you have a wonderful night. And we will see you when we come around again. Night, Zerk. Night, Dirk. Damn, Dirk, Dirk took all of our rambling and just tied it off nicely, didn't he? Yeah, I think it, we're. I think at this point, the more we talk, the more we're going to have to reboot ourselves. I think you're right. Yeah. Much more streamlined version. So I think we're probably done. So what I'll say is the thing I keep saying is. Watch Cobra Kai <laughs> and She-Ra. Those are both real good. And I guess if you want to watch a random legacy sequel, Return to Oz is on uh, Disney Plus. And it's one of those that doesn't like it keeps the character names. <laughs> like the characters yeah. are the same. Uh, the the ones that you know are in but like Dorothy but it doesn't keep the tone it doesn't keep the feel it doesn't keep the the format like it's not a musical it's really good but it's I think it's one of those that it does its own thing so hard yeah that you sort of have to go huh <laughs> and give it some respect I love it because I love it uh, like it's really good. I, there's an upcoming School of Movies episode about it where that I was on. It'll, I think he said it'll be up in another two or three or four weeks, and it was uh, where we went off uh, on like the psychological aspect of it, and it's oh, it's so good. <laughs> but really, what we're saying is, don't watch the new Point Break. <laughs> Na na na. <laughs> oh man, does the new Godzilla count as a like it's an American reboot uh, sort of thing? Godzilla's had so many reboots and reimaginings, and then once you think you finally got an idea of it, they make two of them fight each other, and you're like, wait, what? Uh, I yeah. don't know. Like the the first of these American reboots, uh, the the from 2014 was not good. No, it wasn't. Like, Godzilla was awesome, and the last, I think, 15, 20 minutes was awesome? And the rest of the I movie, just... you're just following along the damn jarhead, and you're like, what the hell is going on? Why are we with this toolbox? I just remember being confused as to when they're like, oh, well, we can't really do anything about Godzilla swimming. Let's do a cool promo shot where all of our boats go in formation with him across the ocean, so we can put that in the trailer, I guess? Yeah. Like, okay, this movie doesn't make any sense. <laughs> Yeah, it was it was not good. Uh And also the main character was a, was a Gary Sue as hell and that's a fact. If you don't like it go to hell. Now, it's like they ran out of Brian Cranston movie money like 10 minutes in. <laughs> right? But then the sequel, Godzilla King of Monsters, was one of the best freaking movies I've ever seen. That was, it's what I wanted in my head. It, it, it's, it's another one that does what the Masters of the Universe uh, reboot did. It took what Godzilla is like in your head when you're a kid and put it on screen. And it's amazing. And I'm pretty sure that Godzilla uh, versus Kong is going to be amazing as well. And it's because, sure, there's lots of backstory and it's fleshing things out. But it knows, unlike the, the, the 2014 movie, it knows what you're here to see. And it gives you that. Like you're here to see giant monsters slamming into each other. That's the point. And it's like, right, we're going to do that here. 
unlike the first one where you're like, the, the, the whole goal is to see Godzilla and Godzilla is only kind of in the movie. Oh, yeah. You're reminding me that I need to track down and watch um, uh, Sheen Godzilla from 2016. I've heard um, that one is also really good. It's weird because the movie is written and directed by the guy who does Evangelion. Yeah, yeah. And I'm curious. It's also one I mean, that has a very uh, specific point. Like, Godzilla is is best in the Japanese movies when he's a metaphor. And then yeah. this one, Godzilla is totally a metaphor. Yeah. So, yes. Yeah. Nice. Kaiju. But all right. I guess we should stop there, huh? Yeah, we probably yeah. should. So how about some final thoughts from you two? Um, I'll go first since I am the guest. I think that's how that works. Sure, why not? Um, Yeah, so my final thoughts are when it comes to remakes and reboots and all of that kind of stuff, I am my initial reaction whenever I hear that something is getting a remake is to roll my eyes. Yep. Like, I'm tired of things getting remade. I'm sick of most of the nostalgia that people try to sell to me at this point. Like, I've seen so many things said in the 80s that I don't care anymore. Um, I've seen so many things that are, hey, remember this thing? We did it again, but with CG. I'm like, I don't care. I don't care about any of that. That's not fun. I understand for all the reasons we've said that it is a risk to try to do something brand new. And there's a good chance a lot of great, absolutely brand new things are out there that I'm not hearing about because I only hear about the things that are super hyped because people have nostalgia for them. But I need, at this point in time, people to tell me that something is really good. If it's just a remake, I'm not going to go see it. So you've got to earn it. Like, even FF7 Remake, best game I've played in years. I was really down on it until I was physically playing it. Like, you've got to drag me there, and you've got to make me drink. And then I'll be like, okay, fine, you're right. Um, and that's you, even after playing the uh, physically playing the demo. Yeah. The demo, all right, so here's the thing. Like, if you've been on the fence on it, and you played the demo, and you didn't like the demo, the demo is crap. The demo is the least exciting and fun part of the game. I know they just did the demo level because it was the original game's opening and they're like, oh, cool, this will show off the gameplay. No, the bombing mission is stupid. Um, it's closed quarters. You don't get to see the world. You don't get to explore anything. None of the good parts are covered in it. It's just the combat system. And it's a very limited version of the combat system. So don't worry about that one. Actually give it a play or watch people playing it on YouTube for a little bit and see if it's something that looks fun for you. Everyone in the world did it. Like, I promise, you can find replays easily. Go watch the woman who voice acted Eris play. That's fine. It's fun. Um, you can do all that. Uh, but yeah, like, you have to make me do it. But overall, like, you know, if anyone knows any things that are legitimately good remakes, then I'm always open to hear it. Like, tweet at me. Squee Goblin to Bob. No I and Goblin, because the I is still waiting for us to record another episode of Eminem, and I think it might be dead now. Um, no telling. I haven't fed it. I know that much. But Crap, I wasn't on the schedule to feed it, was I? I mean, I guess it doesn't matter now, does it? Um, either way. Uh, but yeah, so that's about it. Like, Let me know if there are actually good remakes. Um, Japan has finally started hitting the remake bug for a bunch of anime. Like The last few years have been a bunch of those. Um, I wasn't going to go too long on here about that because it's me talking to myself. But if you're interested in anime from 20 years ago and it was vaguely popular, there's a good chance there's a newer version of it or an extension of it now. So maybe go look up things you used to like and see what's there. <laughs> That'll I be think that the only anime I know about is from 20 years ago. <laughs> well, then this is the perfect time for you. All right. It's like looking over the... 2001 catalog for DVDs at Suncoast. Like, that's what the current anime seasons are. <laughs> oh, wow. I used to love doing that. That was awesome. Yeah. <laughs> well, how about you, Mike? Mike has been having uh, technical issues behind the scenes, everybody, which is why I just said, how about you, Mike? And there was silence. Yeah, I wondered if that had just happened because I just heard a bunch of silence and I'm like, oh, I bet Chewie is asking me. <laughs> Go ahead. We could start saying over if that helps. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, final thoughts. Um, touching on a comment I made before, it really helps if there's some 
uh, depth to, to the material that's worth exploring it again in a different way to do a remake or a reboot. You know, that's, for example, that's super easy with um, like comic book movies because some of these characters have been published for decades. You can do all kinds of stuff with all the different events that have happened to them and the different takes that all the writers that have taken them on have given the characters over the years. That's easy. You can do that. Um, sometimes you can get that with like a, a book that has, you know, just a, a really deep story or different ways to approach the visuals or some different points of history or backstory that you can explore. Like, uh, I definitely want to see the Dune movie. I'll have to figure out how to do that at some point. God, I hope that doesn't there's, suck. There's just a lot. I know, me too. But there is just a lot, a lot there that you can explore, and different ways to approach the visual elements and the nuances of each character and everything. There's a there's a lot of stuff there to dig into. Um, if I heard that there was going to be another, uh, you know, redo of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, I would go watch it. There's always new stuff to to fit in there and to explore, you know, and Douglas Adams would do it too. Like there are elements in you know, the book and the television miniseries and some old games and some other material that don't agree with each other. And in some cases blatantly contradict each other, but that was him exploring the space, you know, on purpose, <laughs> you know, oh. just to, to see what other um, fun, fun and interesting things he could uh, cram in there. And there's still a lot to, get creative with the material so that'd be something i'd be interested in too but when it's narrow like you were talking about with something like robocop or point break there's not really an opportunity to do anything new and interesting unless you just really want to say oh i really wish what have, would it have been like for such such actor to be in that movie it's like okay sometimes that's an interesting question but yeah not enough to with, actually with Robocop. It's... There was the potential for a new and different kind of social commentary that just wasn't there. Mm -hmm. They just wanted to make an action movie. Yeah. Yeah. Which is a shame. But, but yeah, the person making it has to care about the material in order to do a good job. And there has to be enough room to explore in order for the new thing to be interesting those are some of the key elements that i see yeah also just because we would be remiss if we got through the entire episode without saying it it is also acceptable to remake things if the majority of the cast become muppets a hundred percent that's just the law yeah. yes pretty yes. much anything if there, you make it mostly muppets yeah there that's been a thing on uh uh, Twitter relatively recently was, hey, what movie, if you could remake a movie with all Muppets except for one character, what movie and which character would you keep as human? Yeah, and it's pretty universal that you can do that with nearly every movie. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. great. I would I would watch a movie where um, Baron Harkonnen was the only human and the rest of the Dune cast were Muppets. Oh, God. Be funny. Yeah, my, my favorite was that... Knives Out, and it doesn't matter which character you leave as human. <laughs> That's great. I haven't even seen that movie, and I know exactly how well that would work. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. I, okay, my Mike, one, you need to see Knives Out. <laughs> it's like, I, I really wanted to see um, someone do that treatment for The Great Gatsby. Because <laughs> I love the idea that Nick is just the guy who's walking into the world of all of these super rich Muppets <laughs> and what rich Muppet life is like. And he gets involved with like, you know, staring longingly at Gatsby Muppet while not admitting it. And then he's like sort of settling with the girl Muppet that he's supposed to be with, with society. And then watching Gatsby Muppet ruin his life um, <laughs> all the way through. I want to watch this for like 90 to 120 minutes. That's what I want in life. And it is now in public domain, so this needs to happen. 
man. <laughs> stuff that's public. The, the Muppets need to jump on more public domain stuff like they did back Absolutely. in the day. Absolutely. Like, it's there now. Yeah. Like, public domain goes so far back that we can do this now. How awesome would a Muppet retelling of Dracula be? Could it be the Count? And, like, the uh, answer uh, is uh, so uh. awesome. Like, <laughs> Could it, it doesn't just straight matter. Up be the Count? <laughs> Like the Count pretending he's not Dracula or just like being, you know, actually just the Count who wanders down and then they have to hunt him down across Europe and everything. That would be amazing. <laughs> oh, my God. Anyway. One. One victim. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> Three vampire brides. Ah, ah, ah. Oh, jeez. Anyway. <laughs> 611! 611 mana pools! Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> Alright, well then, that comes to, to me, and I, I sort of already did mine with the Cobra Kai and She-Ra, and oh, and Animaniacs. <laughs> uh, so I will just do the Patreon thing, so hey, if you go to patreon.com slash the mana pool, you can be a lifeguard and get uh, YouTube videos and podcasts early. You can get the odds and ends, which are currently miserably far behind, but you know, and you can get the sponsorship shout out on the podcast and on the end screen. I just redid the end screen too, to make it cleaner and one screen instead of ha hiccups, instead of having a fade in the middle. And it's, it's also purple. So it's a million percent better and it doesn't have my face on it so it's like two million percent better except my f it had my face twice on it so it's like four million percent better yeah i'm just so saying carry the one um yeah that's about right yeah. yeah so uh i'd like to thank our mythic lifeguards in oh, i don't know this order yeah Let's see here. Kim Maho, Jake Jansons, PJ McMullen, Team Uhelas Haru, Jason Kaus, Andrew Hunt, The Beast Father, Aaron Goodwine, Al, Cody Buckowing, Casey, scroll, 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 Jason Doan, John Parker, Jeff Spencer, Beardy Man, Aleph Cat, Scuzzo, Connor Kennedy, Gothic Man, Mr. Dr. Lewis, and ALK Alters. Yay. Uh, so... Yeah, let us know. I, I apologize for not mentioning <clears throat> My Little Pony. Uh, let's see, what else was on the list that didn't get mentioned? Hang on, hang on. Oh, Blade Runner 2049. It. Do, do, do. Uh, Wolfenstein. Call of Duty Modern Warfare, which is getting a, or already got a like HD remaster for some reason. Uh, the Tony Hawk 1 and 2 remastered or remake or whatever it was called and Punch-Out. I apologize for missing all of those, but hey, look, now we mentioned them. <laughs> so, yeah. With that, we'll be done with Manipool 611. Uh, this is a long one, but I, I think it's worth it. And let us know what you thought of us doing a Not Magic Podcast uh, episode. And if uh, you have any other topics that you think that we could do on a Not Magic episode in the future. Yay. So thank you all so very much for listening. And uh, go watch a remake. Or a reboot. Or a remaster. Or a, what was it? Legacy sequel. <laughs>